witness is. Good morning. Um, we have quorum. Um, you're all very welcome um, to this morning's meeting. I can advise all members of the need to maintain social distancing throughout the meeting. Um, we have um, Ms Anderson on Starleaf. Um, Ms Kelly may be joining us at a later date. Um, all other members are in. All other members are in um, in the meeting room. Today we will consider subordinate legislation briefing from the PSNI on road safety, the departmental briefing on the October monitoring round, and we'll also receive a briefing from Assembly Research and Information Service in relation to decarbonising transport in Northern Ireland. We have no apologies and um, chair's business. Um, are members content to receive annual reports by email? Agreed. And do members agree for committee staff to publish research papers after they have been considered by the committee? Agreed. Thank you. Um, the, the chairperson's liaison group met yesterday and we were informed that legal advice is being sought regarding committee external meetings and visits. And this advice hopefully will be with us um, by the end of the week. Um, the Committee for the Economy has cancelled its external meeting, which was scheduled on the, uh, in and around the same date, or on the same date as, as ours. Um, so do members wish to postpone our meeting on the 21st to um, await um, receipt of legal, uh, advice from legal services? Right. Um, if, you, if you're happy to do that then, the meeting then will take place in the Senate chamber as usual, um, and the visit maybe to Wright Bus can be rescheduled after Halloween. I am a bit sort of curious about this because we have been out. I mean, certainly the, the Bill of Rights, we had an external visit, we had an external meeting rather. Um, so it seems a bit odd that we're in this situation now, but I'm guessing just with changes in, in regs and so on, maybe that's um, where we are. But um, hopefully, we'll get that advice sooner rather than later so that we can then. Um, schedule future meetings. Can you clarify? It's legal advice rather than health advice. It's legal yeah, advice. Yeah, it's, le it's legal advice. Liability. It's on liability of the assembly for right. committees to go out on external meetings. Okay. Although there have been um, external meetings, but up until this point, but um, well, that's where we are now. So, um, hopefully, we'll get that um, quickly because obviously, if we have made arrangements, then we don't like to to let people down either. So. Okay, members agreed to that. Then moving then to our draft minutes at page six. Um, that's the meeting as of the meeting of the 30th of September. Are members content? Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving then to matters arising at page 13. And again, it's from the meeting of the 30th of September. Are there any issues that members have as a consequence of that meeting? Nope. Okay, content. Um, nothing else? No? Okay, correspondence then. Just draw your attention to correspondence memo at page 23 and in table papers at page 3. Um, at page 45, we've received response from Northern Ireland Water to um, the committee um, correspondence following the briefing on the 16th of September. Members wish to discuss, or are you content with the contents of that? Everyone's content, my goodness. Okay, okay um, page 40, we have a copy of um, TransLink's a recovery, uh, responsible recovery document. Um, TransLink will be briefing the committee next week, so if there are any comments, maybe we could leave it to then. At page 62, we have correspondence from the Speaker's Office providing guidance on the delivery of the statutory instrument element of the EU exit transition period legislation <coughs> programme. Members, any comments? Sure, Justin, obviously we're getting a briefing on Brexit. Next week. Next week, so there's, there certainly will be questions in terms of the SIs and the SRs and the impact and what's, what's devolved and what's, uh, <coughs> what's reserved, so we'll bring that up mm -hmm. next week. We'll definitely Although I think... Okay. Primarily, that correspondence really just sort of setting out yeah, how that's out, uh, an, no, uh, the uh, format and so on of yeah. that, as opposed to any details for each of the committees. Um, page 82, we have ministerial response to our correspondence following the meeting on the 16th of September. Um, again, members, any comments to make or any content with that? 
Okay, page 107, correspondence from the Assembly EU Affairs Officer providing a copy of the Northern Ireland Common Frameworks Overview. Content. <coughs> Correspondence from committee and member support office providing details of an online workshop on questioning skills. Um, this training is being offered to all of the committees and will take place this month if members are interested in doing this. While we can't fit this into a committee meeting time, um, it may be something that we could do directly after our, our meetings conclude. If members have any comments, if you wish to if you think that would be useful to do, well, we can maybe make arrangements for that to happen. It takes 90 minutes. Um, Miss Anderson's nodding. Anyone else keen to do that or Just not really getting an awful lot back here? <laughs> Chair, are you, are you proposing we do that as a committee or as up to individual? Well, we have to do it. We do it as it's. It's done as a committee, rather, because obviously um, each committee has a different approach. Enough, um, okay. So it may be something that, we, if we are going to do, we would do it as a, as a, as a group, um, and it would be done. If we were going to do it, it would be having to allow that extra time after a committee yeah. session. Just obviously, we'll, we'll have to, we're time limited here yeah. currently, and I don't know where you would get an hour and 90 minutes added on, if we have to be out by 12. <coughs> Probably have to be the afternoon. You can find a room. Or we, we, we go, a room. Yeah, we go room one five or something like that. Could it occur in a different room in the, in the building? Um, that might be an option. Occurring Could other rooms room be suitable, and we might be able to room, have yes. it straight on after the meeting? Um, okay, well, we just leave it with the committee staff, yeah, maybe yeah. to try and organise, and then come back with some options for us. Burp, burp, burp. And it's just even possibly scheduling it as part of the, almost a committee meeting, you know, to go for a more compact meeting and then go no. for it. The problem is if we if we run over, even if we have two briefings, sometimes that can run over to two and a half hours. We wouldn't have enough time to do an hour and a half of the okay. beginning before the finance committee needs to come in. That's the problem that we have with it. Okay. Well, we'll leave it with you yeah, then to try to yeah, coordinate. Sure. Okay. So members content then with the actions as a, um, on the correspondence memo, and we'll agree that. Moving then to item six, which is SR 2022-05, the motorways traffic amendment number two regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. It's at page 155. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-205, the Motorways Traffic Amendment No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, there is no objection to the rule. Okay. Item 7, SR 2020-206, the Cushiny Park Macrofelt um, Abandonment Order Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 162. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 16th of September 2020 and was content. Response on wrong council consulted is in the correspondence at page 86 and had been rectified. So the, the rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Please. Yep. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-206, the Kulchini Park Macrofelt Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, is no objection to the rule. Item 6 was SR 2020 207, the Llewellyn Drive, Lisburn Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 170. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 16th of September 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative <coughs> resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-207, the Llewellyn Drive, Lisburn Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, there is no objection to the rule. SR 2020-208, the Planning Development Management Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, at page 180. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee 
um, by correspondence on the 28th of September 2020, and members gave their approval for the proposal and was formally agreed at the meeting on the 30th of September. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR um, 2020 the Planning, Development, Management, Temporary Modifications, Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, as no objection to the rule. Thank you. Moving then to item 10, which is our briefing from um, the Police Service of Northern Ireland in relation to road safety. The briefing paper is at page 190. Hansard will record the meeting and we're going to welcome to um, the meeting Assistant Chief Constable John Roberts and Chief Inspector Diane Pennington. Um, she's Chief Inspector for Road Policing. Good morning. Good You're morning. both very welcome to the Clare and Interest is a member of Carrick, our Treasurer to Carrick Fergus Road Safety Committee. Okay, and the Clare and Chairman of the Carrick Fergus Road Safety Committee. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Um, you're both very welcome to um, the meeting this morning. Um, your presentation has come very highly recommended um, by members of the Policing Board. So, um, if you are content to um, to go through your presentation with us, and members will follow up with some questions. Yes, OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to, to be here to speak to you today. Um, I do need to clarify now when you mentioned presentation. So I have some opening comments that um, we were going to give and then right. take questions. Is that yes, your course, understanding absolutely. also? Yes. 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 <laughs> OK. So, um, uh, yes, thank you. So by way of introduction, so I, I'm a temporary assistant chief constable um, with responsibility for operational support department, which includes um, uh, roads policing, um, our tactical support groups, um, uh, armed response vehicles, the police college and some other areas. And, and this is Chief Inspector Diane Pennington, who is um, the head of um, the roads policing unit. Um, and so um, uh, it's her full time um, role in, in respect of um, roads policing. So. Um, the PSNI Roads Policing Unit, and, and I know you have received a brief in advance. Um, we currently have um, 100 and over 170 officers and staff who are um, engaged full time in uh, roads policing. Um, it is a significant um, commitment by the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and um, obviously um, it is worth stating that um, road safety is something that can affect um, everyone in our community. Um, you know, and um, despite the good progress that has been made, um, you know there are still regular tragedies on the roads. And um, this calendar year, to date, sadly, um, um, as the figures of yesterday, there are 46 people who have lost their lives on on the roads in Northern Ireland, and we are very mindful that that's 46 families who are who are um, without a loved one in this year alone. Um, so it is um, something that we do make a significant commitment to that we are currently investing in and want to invest in further in the years ahead. So, um, and, and to briefly summarise, um, our resource is based um, across the country. We have um, dedicated full-time units based in the uh, Portadown and Antrim areas, who provide um, a 24/7 response to the strategic road network. And we'll also carry out enforcement as required on that network. And we also then have further um, uh, uh, support groups in um, Fermanagh and in um, Derry, London Derry, um, who uh, will carry out enforcement on a proactive basis. We also then have um, a collision investigation unit who work out of Lisburn and cover the whole country, who um, will respond to and investigate all fatal um, road traffic collisions um, and will also assist local district policing in terms of um, any uh, serious injury collisions. And um, that is you know, a resource that we are very pleased to have, um, uh, specialists in, in investigating fatal road traffic collisions um, and um, uh, have grown in expertise um, over, over many years in terms of their um, ability um, to work with forensic scientists to interpret um, scenes um, of fatal road traffic collisions um, uh, and, where necessary, then um, submit papers to the Public Prosecution Service if, if that is required. We also have a road policing development unit um, who help um, manage our policy and some other um, specialist um, functions within roads policing. 
Um, and within that unit, we also have uh, traffic management officers who will work with partners around um, alterations to the road network and um, give advice around potential changes to speed limits and assist with large operations where traffic management plans might be required. And we further have um, road education officers who will um, uh, assist in engaging with vulnerable uh, road users, um, schools, and, and other groups as necessary. And I think it is worth saying at this point that uh, you know there is a long-term trend over many years that the people that um, do lose their lives and do um, uh, become injured tend to be, firstly, more men uh, rather than women, and secondly, in the age group of um, age 16 to 24. Um, and, and that's maybe not um, that surprising, and I suppose it's just related to that age group's um, uh, likelihood to uh, maybe accept risk or act in a way that um, it, it, it displays more risk uh, behaviours um, and succumb to peer pressure um, and that type of thing. But that 16 to 24 uh, male group is um, sadly where, where we do see more victims and more people um, injured. Um, also, then, um, the Fixed Penalty Processing Centre is um, located within the police estate and um, between 2007 and 2019, have processed um, almost um, 190,000 fixed penalty tickets. Um, so we do have um, some recent um, initiatives that um, uh, you, you may well be aware of. So um, we participate and regularly deploy in the um, Close Pass um, Cyclist Safety Scheme. Um, an area for focus of us um, going forward, um, there's probably three, um, and whilst the numbers remain small, they're probably the growth areas in terms of, um, sadly, persons being killed or injured on the roads are cyclists, uh, motorcyclists and elderly pedestrians um, are three categories that um, we, we will intend to focus on going forward. And um, the Close Pass Scheme um, is one example of that. Secondly, then, we have recently launched um, the PSNI um, Interceptor Team, which is a pilot scheme that was launched last month, um, and that is around um, the greater focus, which is in line with um, the sort of national um, direction of uh, policing in terms of um, policing uh, the roads, not just being around excess speed, but also around identifying where criminals are using the road network in pursuit of their uh, criminal activities. And, um, uh, the intercept team, which relies on auto plate, automatic <coughs> number plate recognition, um, where is um, so as um, police officers can receive alerts using the technology of criminals who may be on the road and um, intercept um, any uh, suspects where appropriate. Um, and um, where it is relevant, then um, we will use powers to seize vehicles, remove dangerous vehicles from the road, and prevent people using the, the road network in further pursuit of crime. Um, and it's not just, it is important to say that it's not just about um, motoring offences per se, but wider criminality. Um, so that is a pilot that uh, was launched last month. Uh, we will be reviewing uh, uh, process upon the conclusion of the pilot. Um, and it is something that, if successful, we would hope to then um, reach out wider on and, and enhance our capability. Um, next, then, um, just last week, we have launched um, a second pilot, which is um, our safer transport team in conjunction with uh, TransLink. And uh, it's a small team of officers um, who will uh, work in partnership with TransLink on the uh, transport network um, around the transport hubs and on trains and buses um, across the country. And again, that's about um, reducing antisocial behaviour on the uh, infrastructure network um, and uh, dealing with crime. Um, and we are also enhancing um, our uh, capability in the aforementioned collision investigation unit and enhancing the training uh, of the officers within that to detective standard, uh, given the complexity of some of the investigations. So um, just to uh, maybe touch on some statistics briefly, and um, are, so the statistics, as you will probably all be aware, are published um, and are in the public domain, um, and we also report to the uh, policing board in respect of um, uh, the road safety elements of the policing plan. Um, so um, whilst, whilst we separate um, the statistics between uh, fatal collisions and um, persons who are seriously injured, it's probably the combined total that actually is, is more useful when looking at the statistics, because um, you know, the, there is sometimes um, 
I suppose it, it's very tragic circumstances, but there is a fine line sometimes between somebody who sadly passes away as a result of a collision and those that are um, seriously injured, um, and the serious injuries um, uh, we, we don't make light of either. So there is a long-term trend, you know, over. Um, uh, you, you know, going back into previous decades, figures were generally much higher. So, um, a, as I said, um, this year to date, um, sadly, 46 people have lost their lives on the roads. But I mean, going back into the 70s and 80s, those figures would have been in the hundreds, um, and have been maintained at a much lower level in in, in the last 10 years. Um, the, this year to date, and clearly, um, COVID-19 has played a large part in there being less traffic on the road, particularly between March and June this year. So, with less traffic on the road, we would obviously expect less um, collisions. But um, so, uh, this year to date, then um, there has been a reduction overall um, of um, 108. Um, Total uh, persons um, killed and serious, seriously injured. Um, so that's from 481 last year to 373 uh, this year. Um, the, the figures are quite small, but you know we do break down, and it is available within our statistics around what parts of the country, um, uh, by, by policing district, council areas, that the collisions happened, and secondly, um, the uh, age, gender, etc. of of the persons um, killed or injured. It's probably worth also stating that over 41 per cent of prosecutions through the courts in Northern Ireland um, do relate to motoring offences, so um, it, it, th that is quite significant. Um, also then, um, <coughs> between, um, b between August 19 and July 20, there were um, and, and again, that captures the uh, COVID period in the earlier part of this year. There were over 45,000 PSNI detections for motoring offences, and that, that's a decrease of 10% on the, in the previous 12 months. But that, as I say, could be put down chiefly to COVID. Um, and the largest offence group within that is speeding, with a total of um, 8,000 detections. Um, and that then um, does not include the detections from the Road Safety Partnership, which um, is an additional f over 47,000 speeding offences for the same 12-month period. Um, there has been um, recently, a, um, in, in July 2020, um, Her Majesty's Inspectorate um, has, reproduce, has produced a report um, entitled um, "Summary." Summary of, or sorry, the, the report is called "Roads Policing Not Optional," and um, there were a number. There's 13 recommendations made within that, um, not all of which relate um, directly to policing. Some of them relate to the uh, Department for Transport in England and Wales and the Home Office. Um, but in general terms, the, 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 we, we will be considering each of those um, in, in conjunction with partners as to how they might be um, applicable to Northern Ireland. And I think it reflects. Um, my earlier comments around um, roads policing being viewed as um, not just about excess speed, but actually the manner in which the uh, roads network uh, um, is being used to by criminals on occasions, um, and also reflects um, our general and, and desire before the report to um, invest and enhance our capability uh, in terms of um, technology and. Uh, more professionalism and um, putting additional resource um, in line with other demands uh, into this area. So I'll, I'll maybe pause there, if that's okay, Chair. For, okay, thank uh, you. Uh, um, Diane, do you have anything you wish to say at this stage? Or? Um, no, I'm just I'm happy to take any, any questions that are uh, coming out of that. Okay, um, and thank, and thank you very much, and thank you for your, for your paper. Obviously, the department they're going to be carrying out um, the review of the road safety strategy and. Um, I'm assuming that there'll be um, quite considerable contact with yourselves with regards to that. And the committee has noted there has been a substantial reduction in the budget which has been allocated to road safety over the last number of years. And obviously, as a consequence of that, then there'll be a reduction in it was the shock and awe um, advertising campaign as well. Just how, how effective has that been um, in, in past years with regards to um, I suppose, behavioural change of drivers? So I think the um, as I, as I stated already, you know, there's been a significant reduction sort of from the pre-2010 period. 
um, and um, it's, it's probably we can't point to any one um, factor um, around that, but certainly you know the advertising campaign, you know, which has been um, impactive, I have no doubt played a part in that, as has um, the increase in um, uh, technology, the increase in uh, um, detections through the camera network. Um, and um, just enhanced um, road safety then, or the enhanced safety of by manufacturers of vehicles themselves. And when you look back two decades ago, whenever it wasn't compulsory to wear seat belts, you know. So there's probably a number of different factors. But yes, it, it would be our view that the um, advertising campaign um, is, a, is a significant uh, factor. And um, just with regards to then education um, and also the sort of physical infrastructure side of things, which um, I suppose from a, an infrastructure perspective and as, as MLAs in our constituency where we would be approached by constituents for, um, you know, sort of speed ramps and so on as well, how effective have, have those types of measures been? Do you have it in yourself? Yeah. Um, so the Traffic Management Office, <coughs> Robert mentioned in, in remarks are the link with regards to the physical infrastructure between PSI and the Department for Infrastructure. So if there are um, significant changes in parts of the road network, um, including your examples there, Chair, about you know speed bumps, um, for example, um, th we work really, really closely and we couldn't do it without DFI input and I, I think they would probably say the same for us. We work very closely to make sure that we're putting the appropriate safety measures in place, but ones which will work with the minimum of enforcement going forward. Um, and we generally get good feedback. We get good feedback through PCSPs, through our neighbourhood colleagues in the police, um, who have maybe brought our traffic management officers in as subject matter experts, if you like, in that area. Um, so it can be on a case-to-case -case basis, but generally good feedback. Okay, and so if you have, if an area has been raised, of con an area of concern has been raised by a community, um, how do you then prioritise resource? Because you know you are challenged with, with the number of, of officers, um, and in, I know that is from experience as well, where we you will have identified various areas, and um, I suppose that you can only deploy the van at certain times or um, they've maybe redeployed somewhere else. So I mean how, how do you how do you manage even the deployment of the resource that you have in order to identify where there is a problem? So again this is something that's done in partnership. So if we have what we call community concern site, which is raised with us in various different ways, it can come up through the PCSP as I mentioned earlier. It might come up through our neighbourhood colleagues who have been engaging with members of the community, or it can come in direct in the form of a letter, for example, from a member of the community, and indeed uh, sometimes from MLAs and from council councillors. So we, so the details of that site, which is enough a lot of the time to do with excess speed, um, we share that with the Northern Ireland Road Safety Partnership, or sometimes it comes direct to them and they share it with us. So, for example, my units in Mahon Road may get reports of a um, road in Market Hill, which has got someone is saying that there's speeding issues on it. So we will go out, it will be part of our routine patrol pattern, we will go out there and we will um, usually get out with the laser and we will monitor the speed and if, if um, appropriate we will stop motorists and we will, you know, pr prosecute them, we will give them tickets for it. And that shed, that uh, site will also be on the schedule for the um, the safety camera vans that you see going about. So it's really about reacting on a case by case basis to um, what is raised with us. We always would like to stop people speeding, not catch them speeding. And, and sometimes residents will come back to us and say, you know, yes, you were there three times in the last two months, and we can actually see a significant drop off. Okay. Um, obviously, so the statistics that, that you have in relation to speed and accidents will then inform um, any additional infrastructure which may be required, be that and maybe a reduction in speed in an area or other, or other physical calming measures. But in the event that there, are, there will be accidents where police aren't in attendance or they haven't been reported, then obviously the, those statistics then aren't collated. 
Um, so anecdotally, people will know that there is a hotspot in an area, but yet the statistics don't reflect that. You know, so how, how do we come to a, sort of a better reflection then of, of an area without that, if there isn't a police response? Well, so, I mean, we will have um, our stats for, um, sadly, um, incidents where um, people lose their lives, secondly then where people are seriously injured, but also then the minor injuries, and that's obviously the majority of collisions. So we will know that and we will know where they are. The other thing that helps inform the partnership then is the uh, data that comes uh, from the department in terms of speed surveys um, and, and how we can factor um, some of that into the partnership for our deployment. So the, um, the deployments are based on um, where incidents have happened, where uh, where incidents have happened, where there has been previous enforcement, and also then the community concerns. So um, it is captured. I mean, uh, th th there may be, I suppose it could take a period of time for um, a particular uh, location to be escalated to the degree where it becomes more on the radar than where it is currently, but, uh, but there is a strong system in place from those different sets of data to inform where our deployments are. I think we probably will all will have experienced this where um, that sort of type of information will have come back and the I suppose what you take from it is that someone will need to be seriously injured or killed in order for something to happen and that becomes um, something then that we have to sort of manage as well um, where, where residents are very concerned about an area but yet the information doesn't necessarily tally with what their experience is. Well, it, it, the community concern aspect that Diana has mentioned, I suppose, is where we're, we're capturing that, and I mean that's, and you know, we are very responsive to that. It, it goes to the heart of you know our ethos of policing with the community that where the community are concerned that that's something that we will endeavour to respond to. So you know, it, 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 it's not the case that it has to be, um, you know, somebody has to lose their life before there will be interest on it. Um, interesting, you have in, in your paper um, the trial. You're keen to trial Operation Snap. Um, perhaps we could talk to us in relation to that. And you're waiting legislative change from DFI um, in order to allow that to happen. So, um, yes. Yeah, so currently, um, in, in England and Wales, um, uh, offenders for careless driving can be dealt with by way of fixed penalty notice, which is not um, the case here. So that legislative change would um, allow for a more speedy resolution and also take out significant demand from the uh, court system. Diane might want to say more about Operation Snap. Yes, we've been very encouraged by the reports that are coming back from um, working, and um, it would be it would we would really welcome the. Um, the change in legislation here to allow us to issue fixed penalty tickets for the offence of careless driving, which would then to set this up. Okay, and is that being progressed with the department? Yes, we, we, we are liaising with them, but at the end of the day, they hold the, the responsibility in that area to make Okay, so to make are you finding a willingness from them in order to do this? And it, because obviously, if that's something that they're they're willing to do, then it'll be something that will come through oh, this yes. committee. So it's really just to get a, a sense of when that might likely come to us. Um, we haven't received any timescales yet, but um, we're 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 hopeful that that, that will be resolved before too long. Okay. I, th I think what we could do is maybe formalise that then. <laughs> Um, uh, and come back to you then, if that's okay, around okay. what um, uh, what any envisaged timescales are, mm -hmm. and, well, and, and, and okay. whether there are that any anticipated hurdles. Okay, that would be useful. Thank you, um, David Hildes, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. And what you've left me to ask now, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was interested in that snap. So that's very good. Now, just interested to see how that will pan out if it ever comes in. Uh, what used to be called. Uh, DIC, there's a di different terminology for it now, isn't there? Under the influence or something? Or Excess. driving under the influence, is that the? Well, there's two offences of driving whilst unfit and um, driving with excess alcohol. Right, right. Is it, is it still the case, really, that the only time somebody will be caught is if they have made a mistake and the police have seen them either not signalling or. There's, there's now, is there still specific roadblocks that used to be years ago which put people off driving? Because uh, there is a worry out there that drink driving is still very prevalent in the community. 
and I get reports all the time, and we'll pass them on and that, you know, but... So, so it's certainly not the case that only where we receive a report um, will um, somebody be detected. Um, uh, and it's worth saying as well that I think um, driving with um, drink or drugs in your system is the fifth most common reason for an accident. So, you know, driving without due care and attention, uh, being in the wrong position on the road, um, uh, maybe not taking heed of a traffic sign or signal are, are more common reasons um, rather than um, drink or drugs leading to collision. But um, certainly um, it is high um, on the radar of all police officers when on duty, and drugs are more prevalent in our society also, and um, there are more detections now of people driving whilst on fit through drugs than there mm. used to be. But there are a number of ways in which um, police officers uh, or uh, users who may be under the influence of drink or drugs come to police attention. It could be from a report from a member of the public, it could be through observation, it could be uh, from a collision. And we do have specific operations in, that, uh, in place for that also. Sometimes I do feel that it's hard luck at times, you know. It, going on the days of the, the old the breathalysers, as it used to be called out there, where you road stops throughout Northern Ireland on certain weekends at night. I think, just in my own mind at the minute, it, it's far too easy for people to jump in the car. Deputy Chair, if I could reassure you that um, uh, here in Northern Ireland we're the only part of the UK currently which has um, legislation in place to do authorised vehicle checkpoints, which I think are maybe the, the nature of which is what you're thinking yeah, of. Yeah, it used to be. So this uh, came in three years ago in Northern Ireland, where um, with the authorisation of, of someone of the rank of at least <coughs> inspector, can um, uh, approve a vehicle checkpoint to be set up on a road and every vehicle can be stopped on that road and required to provide a specimen of breath. So, um, in a way, it's as close as we come to random breath testing, okay. if you like. Now, that is something which is all year round, but we really, really focus on at Christmas. <coughs> and um, in the years since we've brought that in, the number of preliminary breath tests that we've been able to carry out have um, really increased because we haven't had to have the, um, someone committing a moving traffic offence or a suspicion that they are driving under the influence, as you say. So it's been a very, very useful piece of legislation for us. Yep, that's good thing. Uh, just on the educational side of things then, the, um, <clears throat> I know on my own committee, Road Safety Committee, there will work with the local community police and they attend and they're very useful. They're on the ground with us and they take part in projects and various things and attend meetings, so it's quite a good relationship, I have to say. Uh, most of our work would be with sort of the, the primary school age. Uh, what are you doing at the minute in, the, in that 16 to 24 sort of bracket that you're targeting there uh, in, this, in the older schools, potentially? Um, COVID is working a bit against us at no. the moment because at this time of year we would be in full swing of our Road Safe Roadshow um, programme. It's which still I'm going not, then, Yes, yeah. still going strong. I'm not sure if, if the members have seen it um, and I extend an open invitation to anybody to come along and see it. Um, we would do 10 to 12 of those a year normally in secondary school or secondary school age children who, well, like sixth and upper sixth age groups, so new drivers, were trying to um, get their attention at the start of their driving career. It's a, a partnership uh, presentation which is done. It's very hard hitting. I still get a tear in my eye, I have to say, and I've seen it dozens and dozens of times. Um, it's very impactive. Um, we can do it for up to 800 students in a day on two sittings. But with COVID, as you'll understand, we've not been able to do that this year. Um, our education officers are working on with very closely with schools on providing some video material, which they will be able to give to the students to, it won't replace what we do with the Road Safe Road Show, but we hope that it will go way <coughs> towards it. I suppose the thing I would add to that too is that in, in addition to um, dedicated education officers in respect of road safety. As, as an organisation, we've, um, as you'll all be aware, increased our um, footprint of neighbourhood policing officers um, across the country. And part of that um, review of neighbourhood policing um, also includes um, consideration of what our presence is in schools 
um, across the country um, and how we um, engage more effectively with young people. And um, whilst um, road safety would only be a small part of that potential agenda, because there's a vast array of other subjects, it does um, increase the police um, engagement with young people generally and create the additional opportunities to discuss a range of topics, including road safety. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Um, and, and you said at the start, I mean, any any road death, I mean, it's horrendous for the family. And I know that recently in my own constituency, there's a young girl tragically lost her life. And I mean, um, I, I've been I've been on commit, different committees over a number of years, and we have made progress. There's no doubt. But it's like you say, 46 road deaths, one death, it's one death too many. But but I think we're making progress. Just in terms of the figures, I mean. And I know this. I know most uh, the biggest percentage of deaths have been that age bracket, but it's been widely on our rural roads, as opposed to to, to the urban settings. Um, and there's a big. There should. I think there should be a bigger emphasis because rural people have no choice but to get vehicles of their own because of the public transport network. They're totally reliant on, on being independent themselves, and it's something we need to figure. But just see in terms of the figures of. Because ten years ago there wouldn't be as many drivers on the roads, and young people now it seems to be most of the seventeen-year-olds were passing the test as quickly as possible or doing the test. In terms of the figures, because it counts in the overall figure, you know, it, fifty road deaths on average per year sound, and it's really really bad. But we have made progress. But in terms of the numbers, on what what on average would be would be road users. Our drivers on the roads now would be up three percent every year compared, to, or just raise, or, or have you those figures in terms of how, how many people are on the roads? You mean passing the test every year? Uh, I don't think we don't have those figures with us. No, as to how many road users there are, unfortunately, because yeah. because it certainly does claim there's more and more people doing the tests. Yes, you know I mean, I actually just saw before I came in that there's a, a waiting list of two thousand people mm. waiting to do their tests. Yeah. Covid restrictions. Um, I think traffic. There was some work done um, around COVID, which showed that traffic volumes had decreased by around 50% um, in those sort of weeks of lockdown. Um, and of course, we then saw a drop off in the number of people who were killed and seriously injured. So um, your comparison is correct. If there's fewer people on the road, there is likely to be fewer collisions. I think it will be interesting to see with the, um, this new culture of working from home and remote working whether that is something which continues. I, I mentioned that context because the Chair mentioned the road safety strategy and anything we can bring along, whatever we learn from COVID, it will play a part. But, but representing the Board of Constituents, I have to ask this in terms of your engagement with Angiarda Shikana. Do you Oh, ab ab absolutely. I mean, there is, um, you know, regular engagement and regular engagement in terms of both in terms of strategy um, um, as to how we would work together and the planning of joint operations. And then in terms of lifetime incidents. So, for example, the um, interceptor team that I mentioned, you know, were necessary, um, you know, should uh, criminals be using the border um, to either you know, make good their escape or in pursuit of their criminality, yes, we will work um, and continue to work on an operational basis with Angarda Shikana. Um, I suppose the other thing I would say, just the amount of volume of road users, if we look, you know, going back, you know, to the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, there are more vehicles on the road. Whilst we don't have the figures, I think we can all agree there's more vehicles on the road. Um, we also have vehicles that are capable of doing um, greater speeds, and we have more young people as a result on the road too, but yet we have a long-term trend. You know, notwithstanding the tragedy for the families involved, but we have a long-term trend in decreasing figures also. No, and we have, yeah. and that's to say, made, but still one. And I think you know, it's the balance between engineering and education. And I think yes. we made because that age group and was mentioned before. I think education is part of the programme as well. Just a couple of points, because I'm glad you mentioned the market. Hill Road said, I don't know what side you're on, but if you take a wee tip down to Pints Pass and then over to Bottom McNabb and down in the middle town, there's, there's some schemes over there. But we. But some of those areas where we want traffic calming schemes outside schools, and we've dealt with this, all of us have dealt with this before, and I think it's somewhere we need to focus on. Now, I know that uh, certainly the local uh, PCSP teams are working on it, but I would like to see a more 
you know, not so much proactive, but more evidence for yourselves to get those schemes in place. The likes of SEDGE, which are the, the indicator devices, are fairly good. Um, they may not be a permanent tool, but there's something that I would like to see, you know, even, even yourselves as a programme saying, listen, it might work there, because when I'm talking to the traffic branch in, in DFA, they're saying, you know, you need certain stats, you need certain things, and I think proactively together we should be looking at those type of things to, to work. Um, just, just on your briefing, I have two points in the briefing. One on the the, clo the closed pass in terms of the cyclists issue. I mean, we're trying to get cyclists on the road, but the, the, the big issue is safety itself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how does how does that close pass work to try and encourage more cyclists on the road? And I, I, my final question is in relation to the the safe transport team. I mean, could you expand a wee bit more on how that exactly works? And um, is it a role just is it a role in the context of COVID as well, or? So maybe I'll, I'll take the second question, and then Diane can answer the, the close pass one. So the, the safe transport team, um, no, it's, it's absolutely not um, just related to COVID. It's something that we were planning um, in any event, um, and we don't see it um, really as a, a COVID function. Although obviously, you know, if there is COVID-related antisocial behaviour, then it's not something police will step away from. However, um, no. So I mean, what it looks like really is um, police deploying on the transport network which is not something that we routinely did before. Um, it is just a pilot. We'll review the effectiveness uh, at the end of it, but um, it should give confidence to um, uh, people who may feel vulnerable on the transport network, You know, particularly um, late at night or those who are vulnerable in our uh, community, that place will be present, and it, and it should um, uh, uh, detract those or discourage those who might be considering, uh, you know, committing crime on the transport network or, or you know, committing antisocial behaviour. So it's, it's an enhanced visibility by policing uh, to help the community. And the, the cyclist issue. Yes, so the close pass scheme. Um, so how that works is that we have um, a police officer on a, a pedal bike, almost, a, and he or she has a head cam on. And they go out onto a route that we um, have been informed about, where the, you know that which is being used by cyclists a lot, and where there may have been um, issues around careless driving. And they have um, they can speak to their <coughs> colleagues who are on a couple of police motorbikes. So if they are um, if they witness a piece of bad driving on the public bike, close to them is, is, is the usual thing: overtaking on a blind bend for example, as well, or overtaken when someone else is coming towards them. I've seen footage of that. Um, they will then radio to the police motorcyclist who will then um, uh, go and stop the driver. And at the moment, what we're doing with it is we're using it as an education tool. So we're playing back the footage to the driver showing what actually happened from the cyclist's point of view. So far, we've had a very, very good response from all the drivers. You know, they're generally saying, I've no idea I was so close. I will definitely not be doing that again. I'll be looking out for, uh, you know, for... <coughs> and I, I think, Chair, as you mentioned earlier, the advertising campaigns which DFI have led on, there's a, you know, there's a really good one out there at the moment around cyclists and about, <coughs> um, you know, respecting everybody's journey. So it's really sort of, it's tying in with that, because everybody who... You know, a lot of people who are drivers, they're also cyclists at some stage in their area. So that, that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, we have, it's a good um, example as well of partnership because although it was led by road placing, that is now being um, shared out with our colleagues in districts and neighbourhoods who are taking it forward. Okay, thank you. Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> my question sort of relates a couple of questions. First of all, on... on your social media presence or Facebook. In the past, we, I'll give you an example. In Ulster, we had a Markerfeld page, Cookstown page, a Dungannon page. So, for example, if you were doing a speed detection in, for example, a little village in your mills, that went onto the Cookstown page in the local area. It wasn't what people you caught or it wasn't that you'd been seen doing it. It was a social media presence. But that has been removed now to a wider 11 district model where you've met Ulster. My personal opinion, it's not getting the same impact because someone at the far side of Mid Ulster, as in Five Mile Town, does not want to or engage with a speed camera at the Killeray on the northern end of the area. Has that change on the Facebook and social media presence caused you uh, a getting your message out problem? Because all that messaging within policing is not getting out, so I presume yours would be the same. 
but maybe you can prove me wrong on that. Um, so, yes, you are correct in that there has been a consolidation of the um, number of um, Facebook pages that the PSNI are maintaining, um, and th the reason for that was really around the um, ability to maintain them all and the ability to have um, uh, enough users to maintain all those um, pages and have them um, appropriately trained um, and have a level of communication that was appropriate for the police service. Um, there has been some feedback, yes, around you know some. Uh, that's not the only district that's been mentioned that feels that you know there's you know communities within communities and the same message is maybe um, not quite as targeted and focused. And it is something that we will keep under review. And do you see that changing for the benefit? Um, so there have been benefits from the consolidation, um, and, and we see that um, there are no decisions as yet to. Um, create more pages, um, having done the consolidation, but we remain open-minded about it, and um, it is something that would, would be changed if necessary, but there are no, no plans to do so as yet. Okay. The radar centre in East Belfast was closed maybe a couple of years ago now, I'm going from memory. You use PS and I, obviously, or the DOJ put in a budget into that in regard to the whole safety pack. Obviously, fire and other agencies was involved with that. The funding that you use as in PS and I put into that, where was that directed, and was it directed on a road safety benefit? Um, I wouldn't have that information here today as to where the funding went um, uh, when the radar centre sadly closed, um, but, but we can report back on that. You know, it would just be interesting to know. I think the, f the figure jumps up to about 300,000, but it's a fair, it's a fair uh, uh, lump of money. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to know what aspect PSNA looked at, the benefit of that centre, where that money, money then went. Just on the, the SNAP, uh, we talked about briefly there before work. Do you see an issue with that? So let's say that was coming to legislation whenever that happens. Do you see an issue with that, you know, that the public it's a benefit, I don't disagree with the principle, but do we see a problem that a neighbour is, you know, touting his other neighbour? Well, I think, you know, like any uh, system that's part of uh, you know a the justice system, it will come with enough um, safeguards and appeal mechanisms that um, you know nobody is going to find themselves wrongly in the receipt of a fixed penalty notice, just like anybody that receives a fixed penalty notice now has the right of appeal and can take that to a court to make their case if they wish. Um, that would remain the same as subject to the legislation, but I'd be surprised if it's any different than that. I suppose there would be the other uh, you know, people Part of this um, is that members of the public can submit footage. So um, you know, but the other side of that is that you know, road users knowing that um, and knowing that it's not just the police they're looking out for, um, that it's anybody that actually it should in increase their uh, standard of driving. And ultimately, it's about making the road safer for all users. Um, it's about taking dangerous vehicles and dangerous drivers off the roads where, yeah, where appropriate. Thank you. And one final question in, in respect, and Cahill touched on this, road deaths. If we look at all areas across the UK, you know, comparable as in the amount of motorways we have and rural roads, how are we in comparison to all areas of similar size, all our counties in the mainland? Are we, and I appreciate one death is too many, as Cahill has said, to be fair, but are we in a league of that? Are we good or are we bad, if you can understand my point? Of course, yes. So if, if we look at the figures for 2019, um, um, in Northern Ireland, we had a 2% rise on fatalities, which was one more um, death compared to the previous year. Uh, in the Republic of Ireland, they also had one more death, but a, with a bigger sample size, that was 0.7% rise. And then if we, I don't have numbers for individual counties, yeah, yeah, but um, in Great Britain as a whole, that rise was 4%. <coughs> so we are, I suppose, performing slightly better year on year compared to the rest of the UK. But, uh, Thank you. But it would be difficult to make comparisons given the nature of yeah. some of the roads yeah. um, is, in, yeah. in England yeah. and the high volumes of traffic and the greater uh, volume of HGV vehicles. Yeah. Can I just check before we proceed, obviously you're tight for time this morning. 
are you okay? We've got four other members have indicated for questions. Are you content? Yes. To those? Okay. Yes. Thank you, um, Miss Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, John and Diane. I've met you before. I declare I'm a member of the policing board, so um, it's it's good to see you here. Because one of the questions I think I'd asked was what partnership working did you have with the department? So um, it's very helpful to have you here. I just have a couple of small points, I suppose, um, mainly I suppose out of interest, but based on the, on the time we're living in with with lockdown, <coughs> um, one of the issues I suppose brought to our attention was that because there was less traffic on the road, people were more inclined to speed. Is that something that you, you had noticed yourselves? Um, was that an issue that, that, that became prevalent? Um, not, not to any degree that there's a, a strong evidence base over it. I think um, you know certainly um, members of the public, I am aware, did feel that. Um, I mean, our stats show that detections overall were down this okay. year compared to last year. Could be maybe because of less traffic. Um, yes, that. less. Yes, well, there was less traffic for sure too. Yes. And because I noticed in the April to June period that nine out of the 14 deaths um, were vulnerable road users, so for example, um, motorcyclists, pedestrians, things like that. So um, I just thought that was quite interesting in that. Yeah, and I think what, so. What we would say is that really with some of these trends, you need to view them over you know at least a three-year period. But yeah. yeah, as I said earlier, you know we are mindful of vulnerable road users. There have the figures are small, but there has been an increase in. Yeah. Um, you know, more cyclists killed and seriously injured motorcyclists and, and elderly pedestrians. Um, there are also, at the same time, you know, there's an increased um, trend and enthusiasm for cycling. So there are more cyclists on the road as well than, than there was maybe even five years ago. Never mind ten or fifteen. Yeah, yeah. I suppose over that period, there's quite a lot of good weather as well, which would, would yeah. be an incentive. Yeah. Um, and I know my colleague has kind of touched on this around the schools. Um, obviously, the department recently has rolled out uh, the 20 mile an hour zones um, outside 100 schools across the north. So it was really just to kind of get any feedback, if if, it, if you're able to at this stage, to see what has the impact of, of those be. Do you, do you see that that actually is is a benefit, the reduction in speed limits outside schools, outside schools in terms of road safety? Um, I think, you know, as a general working assumption, yes, obviously yeah. we um, support anything that makes schools safer, but I don't believe we have any sort of firm evidential statistical basis to show that there has yet been a benefit at those locations. Yeah, I think it's, it's quite early days, yeah. as Mr yeah. Roberts says, but um, we have expressed a desire to Department for Infrastructure that that um, it would seem to make sense to try to roll that out across, if all, if not, if, if not all, in the majority of schools across the world. Yeah, no, that's good to hear because that's something I think we've, we've all kind of been saying um, it, it definitely will be beneficial. But look, no, that's fine because a lot of what I was going to say has been covered. But thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe could you maybe move over slightly towards the mic? Oh, sorry. There's a challenge then whenever everyone's speaking to the rear as well and just um, bring it up for Hansard. Um, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, yeah. Chair. Um, yeah, I said I would declare I was previously an employee of TransLink because my first question relates to that. Obviously, the work you are now starting to embark upon with TransLink. Um, there has been particular issues in North Down um, when there's good weather, so it did occur <laughs> this year and it's gone now, uh, with people coming down to Helens Bay and Crawfordsburn. That required quite a significant police response to that. Um, TSG had to come down and we had a police helicopter out in previous years as well. Um, how will this interface with that on an ongoing basis to ensure that when we do get periods of good weather, that there is that policing response in conjunction with TransLink to try to sort of be more proactive in trying to deal with these issues? Because sometimes what happens is that the policing response only comes into place once the problem is actually there's quite a lot of people have travelled to the area and then you're trying to deal with the after effects. You know, this year we had situations where residents ringing me, you know, midnight uh, with still ongoing antisocial behaviour in the area, and that caused real stress and annoyance, and I'm really, really grateful for the police resources that were put there in conjunction with TransLink. The TransLink and the police went well beyond what you know the, they should have had to do, uh, and in particular times of real stress in terms of the dealing with the pandemic. This is how this is going to work on an ongoing basis to assist that effort. So, um, I, I think it will help. Uh, uh, you know, uh, on a basic level, it will certainly help. There is um, this is a small team of seven officers um, uh, only at this time, and, and it is only a pilot. But what it will allow us to do is to enhance um, relationships with TransLink to understand each other's demand better, and for us to start to gain a better understanding of the uh, 
Arms Link network and uh, to start f for us to um, work in a greater way in partnership. So when we know that there are large numbers of people using the, the network, the transport network, to get to a location, it will allow us to um, profile resource accordingly where appropriate. Um, so in, such as in the case that you mentioned, if we become aware that a large number of people are going to a certain area. Some of those incidents, whilst they are not um, unprecedented, and we have seen them in previous years, some of those incidents that we saw this year of large crowds of people gathering in open areas um, was no doubt driven by the um, health regulations and that other areas were closed, quite rightly. Yeah. But um, you know, we may not see that every, every year too. Um, so uh, it, will, it will allow us to gain a greater understanding and to uh, forward plan to a greater extent. But I would just caveat that by saying that it is a small team of officers yeah. and it is only a pilot at this stage. That's appreciated. I know there are yeah. other problems such as in East Antrim and there are yeah. ongoing issues. It's 52 know. weeks a year. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's residents are tortured. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. But no. the, uh, um, you know, the, it, it, one of the key elements of the uh, safer transport team is uh, allowing um, people that may feel vulnerable um, to have greater confidence in using the uh, transport system, and you know that will extend at times to you know our assessment. Well, actually, this is now impacting residents in a certain area as well as those using using the uh, transport network. I do really appreciate appreciate all what's happened to date and all the efforts, and I think this is a, a positive thing. One other and last question is just around the average speed cameras. They were installed a number of years ago on the A2 Bangor to Belfast Road and had a serious positive impact in terms of reducing the amount of people who were killed and seriously injured. There still, unfortunately, sadly, has been people killed and seriously injured on that road, but the numbers have significantly reduced, and it's had a, a, a good impact on that. Is there any other road areas in Northern Ireland that you feel would benefit from an average speed camera system, which ensures that speed along the actual the whole duration of that road is then reduced? Um, so, I mean, that would be part of a whole wider consultation and discussion. Um, uh, I'm not aware of any plans um, or any uh, potential scope for further at this time, but. Um, so the, apart, apart from the most recent scheme, which hasn't been put in on the Valna Hinch Road out towards Carrie Duff, okay. um, which has very recently been put in, so we would need to review. Um, yeah, yeah. I just I've seen that the impact it's had, and I know previously it was on the the old A1 as well, and it did reduce people's speeds. Yeah. And I think it's something that. Rather than the mobile detection vans, it's something that is an ongoing issue that actually uh, it actually has reduced speed in the area. Whilst obviously not eliminating the problem, but is to be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Okay. Thank you, and again, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I would first like to welcome the creation of the safe transport teams. Um, like others have said, uh, there is a prob wider problem uh, than just roads. There is the issue of antisocial behaviour and perhaps criminality that are using other uh, transport points. And there is clearly a need for um, transfer of, of, of knowledge and experience um, across the um, district boundaries, uh, policing boundaries, so, it, so that expertise can't, can move across. And of course, antisocial activity can travel up and down railway lines as well. So uh, I very much welcome that. Now, in terms of uh, their actions in, in dealing with antisocial behaviour uh, in particular, um, just seeking reassurance that you are uh, uh, operating on terms of a, an education uh, with young people first to try and make them aware of the dangers and not to congregate in, in stations where there are live uh, dangers with trains passing through stations. You're warning them. But ultimately, you may then come to a situation where it comes to enforcement. Now, in order to keep the public uh, uh, support for this action, can you assure me that you will be trying to target ringleaders rather than just some young young person who happened to be standing in the wrong place when you eventually decide to move towards enforcement? Because it will be very serious for those young people once you do that. I'm seeking reassurance that you would be particularly trying to target someone. Um, who would be a ringleader uh, in, in order to uh, get a much safer uh, station area for everybody, for the public, and for those using trains? I think you know, police um, engagement with any person you know who may be you know committing antisocial behaviour or a crime, um, you know, works on a, a scale of 
you know, proportionality. Um, so, you know, I know you use the word target. It's not something we would um, not necessarily use when we're talking about young people, you know, using the, the transport network or elsewhere. But, you know, we are certainly mindful of the impact on a young person of them uh, obtaining a criminal record. Um, and there is, uh, you know, a raft of safeguards and measures and steps that we would go through um, with anybody um, before they would find themselves facing a prosecution. So, it, you know, it's a proportionate and sensible approach, which starts off often with a conversation. Um, and so, um, yes, you know, people that, um, uh, you know, I think what you're saying is, you know, it, it's, it's the worst offenders um, and those who are maybe encouraging and inciting others to gather yeah. that, you know, who are more likely to be met with um, the uh, the stronger parts of the enforcement as, as we as we move through what will start with a conversation. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, and then in terms of uh, community-based speed displays, which are becoming more common, different uh, community safety partnerships have managed to uh, distribute these to, to some members of the community. Um, I myself think they're very effective and I get positive comments from other members of the public. In turn, do you find any difference in terms of the number of complaints that you're getting from particular villages uh, where your enforcement officers may not uh, be able to get out as often as they would wish to? Uh, is this having a positive effect? Have you any evidence that this is having a positive effect on uh, the attitude of drivers and reducing the number of complaints that you are receiving? So, again, it would be a working assumption that is positive and it has benefits, but we wouldn't have specific stats to be able to show that for each deployment of those that it actually reduces the amount of complaints. But the anecdotal feedback, as you've alluded to yourself, is that um, people welcome them um, and um, it has community support. And where possible, we, we will hope to do as much of that as we can. Will you be attempting to gather statistics in case this is that maybe an important message? Maybe this might be an area where there should be further investment. Will you be attempting to gather statistics if it's possible? So I think your question was around statistics about complaints. Yeah, um, on, so on speeding. Yes, I mean I think that's probably um, difficult, um, and you know the level of complaints may not necessarily relate to the level of the problem. But I mean we we will certainly I mean we have a lot of statistics about road safety in terms of um, where offences occur, where collisions occur, and that all of that put together along with the um, information from the department in terms of speed surveys helps um, uh, deploy our helps us plan our deployments. Okay. And then turning to you, uh, the fixed penalty notice, notice that you mentioned regarding careless driving, um, I, again I can see uh, benefits in uh, speedy justice. Uh, the message gets through very quickly. There will be presumably savings in police time as well as court time that release uh, the courts in place to do other activities. So what has been the evidence from England from the introduction of these? Uh, and the other point is do penalty points go alongside a, 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 a penalty notice? Yes, so normally if it's an endorsable penalty notice, yes, then it comes with penalty points. I mean, and people that are convicted of um, careless driving would normally receive penalty points as part of their uh, sentence. Um, so we would anticipate that yes, it would, it would come with points. Um, the evidence, I wouldn't have figures for that uh, from where it's operating elsewhere at this time, and again, we can come back to you with that. And, and is there any time frame as to when you're hopeful that this may come in? Um, so I think we've already indicated that we would formalise that around the uh, time scales for okay. um, in terms of interaction with the department. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And Chair, I find um, the takeaway from this meeting was the information in relation to the number of um, percentage of court cases, um, forty one percent of all court proceedings relating to motoring offences. Um, I don't think that would be as widely known. Um, I would like to ask the PSNI you have mentioned forty five thousand um motoring offences eight of which you said were for speeding, and then you said there was a further 47,000 uh, road safety, is that for fixed penalty notices and the likes? I'm just trying to understand the differentiation between the two figures. Okay, so um, yes, there was 45,000 uh, between the 1st of August 2019 and the 31st of July 2020. There was over 45,000 um, detections for motoring offences, which was a decrease of 10% um, in the previous uh, months. The um, 
and within that there was a total of 8,145 um, speeding offences. Um, so the remainder of them are motoring offences which are not speeding. Um, in addition to that, then the Road Safety Partnership um, detected uh, 47,000 um, speeding over 47,000 speeding offences. So the 8,000 are detected by um, police officers, mainly within roads policing, but not exclusively. Some of them will be district police officers who have, um, you know, who have been trained and equipped with speed detection equipment. D does that answer your question? Yeah, that answers it. I just, I, I thought that they were both combined, but I understand now what you've said when you explain it like that. Can I ask you, you state that the technology is rapidly developing and that there will be a requirement to reinvest uh, your fixed and cameras, your mobile cameras. Um, what will these new potential cameras do that the current ones cannot? Well, so um, we, we, we would be keen to get to a sort of um, from well, in, in terms of, for example, the, the Operation SNAP that we've mentioned, which is technology which you know nearly goes from uh, you know from the offence to um, penalty um, seamlessly, but also in terms of just um, you know technology changes so rapidly in terms of the detections that are happening um, in police vehicles, how we how we capture that um, evidence. Um, and how we um, engage with the motorist in a timely way. Technology changes so rapidly, um, and our ANPR network um, obviously, uh, obviously um, also um, requires um, consideration of enhancement and where cameras are located, etc. So, I mean, it, it's just in line with um, how technology changes in every field that there's a consideration to also do this in this field. Is it that cameras and snap is relating to the individual driver um, and the cars, but if this is technology, and I understand technology, of course, it progresses and changes. Um, I can imagine the expenditure that would be involved in changing the cameras, the reinvestment, so it would be the rationale for that. Uh, so that I'm sure the policing board is looking into to that as well, uh, and I'm sure it is justified. Could I ask a question about, for instance, I'm keen on the old day five road is notoriously bad for uh, for accidents and it's just to get your assessment of the positive impact for large road projects such as the new development of the A5, the A6. We hope that for instance in Derry it's a longer term but we have the Bunkrana road developed as well. So it's just your assessment of the kind of positive impacts that larger road schemes can have on tackling particularly areas that have found themselves where accidents are taking place because of just the nature of the poor infrastructure on the road? Well, so when, when we look at the causes of accidents, um, if you just bear with me one second, please. And these, I mean, these figures are published um, uh, on the PSNI website on a, on a monthly basis. But um, so, you know, there are some, uh, the, the um, the principal factor in uh, those killed or seriously injured in the first um, seven months of this year was um, wrong course or position. Um, uh, number two was excessive speed. Um, looking at number four, emerging from minor road without care. I mean, it, it's difficult to say how many of those things will, will be better or worse on a major road. But, um, for example, you know, it's it. it um, it would be less likely that you would be on the wrong position on a wide road with um, clearly delineated lanes, etc. Not a, n not in every case. Appreciate that, and I think just chair what was said with regards to waiting on the Department for Infrastructure for the legislation. I think that is something that we, as a committee, could ask in relation to Operation Snap. Thank you, and thank you for your answers. Thank you. Um, and just finally, um, obviously as a consequence of the faults in the MOT lifts and then COVID, MOTs have been delayed and um, vehicles, vehicle owners have been given um, temporary exemption certificates. There has been a general concern that perhaps um, the um, maintenance of vehicles hasn't maybe been kept up in the manner in which they would in advance of an MOT test. So anecdotally, or have you any evidence to suggest that's the case? I haven't, we haven't had anything um, statistically or anecdotally come in at the moment. Um, I think it's important to remember that 
uh, this is something that we would be focusing on anyway. So for October, for example, across the whole of the UK is the National Tire Safety Awareness Month. And we've already had some um, bits and pieces put on social media about mm -hmm. uh, advising people about what the legislative requirements are around their tyres and showing them how to check them and reiterating the importance of, of having safe tyres and, and what can happen if you don't. So um, I think the concern is, is a valid one, Chair, absolutely. Um, and I suppose I offer reassurance that from uh, the police's point of view that we are as always out on the roads and um, checking any defects that we find at the time, but also trying to educate road users how to avoid those defects. So there's a month later on in our road safety calendar which looks at lighting, and we will again be doing some uh, promotional um, work around that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for your presentation, and I do appreciate that you've spent a little bit longer than you anticipated. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for that, so thank you both um, for your time this morning. Thank you well, very well, much. Could thank I just make a final comment, if that's okay, because there's one, one issue that we haven't touched upon is the use of mobile phones um, by drivers. Um, and clearly that is you know, something that, again, 20 years ago was not an issue for us, and we now have legislation. Um, so um, you know, we will want to, in conjunction with the Department, just consider and keep that under review and explore what legislative um, opportunities might exist in the future, because I think it is such a significant issue, and, and um, it is important to communities as well that, um, that, that we at least mention it here this morning. Certainly that has been with the committee um, in the last week or so in relation to um, increasing fines um, and, and the penalty points. And I know that there will be a further review in relation to the other uses of, of, the, of technology as well, rather than just the calls. So um, I understand the department are working on that. So, but again, very important to, to raise. Thank you. So thank you both um, very much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so if, if, mem if members are content that we, we write to the department just in relation to mm -hmm. Operation SNAP and Mr Boyle. Yeah, Chair, just another thing, because uh, it's interesting that the, um, if we can get the figures and hours per, by percentage, the rise in the number of road users, because 10 years ago there wasn't as many. I think there's more and more young people now. It used to be rural people in general because they, they were relied on, but there's a lot more urban people you see now. Even the urban schools, or you see most of them taking the car to school. So it's just to get the figures because then it tallies up to the whole percentage of things, which is important too. Okay. Well, that was a good presentation there. Okay. Anything else from that presentation just to raise? Yeah, I just want to ask uh, put, a, put on that uh, query too regarding the uh, radar, radar centre and where that money was. Just, you've got that on here. Okay. Grant. Right, thank you very much. Moving then on to our next item, which is item 11, and it's the departmental briefing for the October monitoring rounds. Um, papers are tabled on your table pack at page 15. And again, Hansard um, will record the meeting. And we welcome um, Linda McHugh um, in her new role. Congratulations. Thank you. Deputy Secretary for Resources, Governance and DU Group. So a new title as well for that role. Acting. Acting. And John Irvine, the Director of Major Projects. Um, Gary Boyd, Director of Finance. And Terry Dean, Head of Financial Planning and Management. You're all very welcome. Um, obviously, the paper arrived quite late yesterday. I'm well aware of um, that, and I apologise. So if you don't mind maybe just taking us through that, probably, yeah. in, in, in some detail. Um, it may reduce the number of questions as well, but um, yeah. certainly um, it would be helpful for us to do that. No, that's fine. And thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to meet the committee today to brief members on October monitoring um, and on my department's in-year budget position. And firstly, I do want to apologise for the lateness of the paper. As you'll realise, the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 made this October monitoring round more complex than normal. Um, so we sent the paper to you as soon as the position was clear within the department. Um, so, as you said, I'm joined today by a number of, of my team and also uh, John Irvine from Rhodes. Um, so we're going to talk you through the paper and then we're here to take your questions. Um, so at the outset, I just wanted to set this in the context of our opening budget position. 
The Minister briefed the Committee on the 29th of April on the 2021 opening budget position following the, the Finance Minister's announcement on 2021 budgets. Um, and at the outset, whilst DFI received increased allocations compared to the previous financial year, they were not sufficient to meet the significant inherited financial challenges that the Minister faces. And to remind you, in resource terms, the Department bid for 57.3 million pressures going into 2021, against which 33 million was received, leaving an opening pressure of 24.3 million. These financial bids were each genuine service pressures that, without adequate funding, are limiting the Department's ability to deliver and maintain a reasonable level of public services. And all of that, of course, was before the financial impact of COVID really hit, hit us. Um, so, turning to the capital budget at the outset, um, the original requirement bid was for 800 million, against which 550 million was allocated as an opening position. This included funding for a number of major areas of spend, including further delivery of the A5, A6, and Belfast Transport Hub flagship projects. The balance of capital has been allocated by our Minister to fund water and wastewater infrastructure, tackle regional imbalance, north-south connectivity, creating thriving, sustainable living places, addressing the climate emergency and, of course, assisting with our recovery from the impact of the coronavirus. In doing this, the Minister has struck a balance between investing in water and wastewater infrastructure, maintaining existing roads and the street lighting network and encouraging modal shift to public transport and sustainable travel, including cycling and walking that will improve the health of our citizens and protect uh, the climate. So whilst the original capital allocation was considerably short of the original bids, it's also true to say that in the first quarter of the year, capital programmes, both within the department itself and in its ALBs, were delayed by the impact of COVID-19 resulting in a, reduc a reduction um, in requirement of 14.5 million, um, including 7.7 .7 million for the A5 and 6.8 million for the A6, and also further reductions in the capital programmes in our ALBs. However, I'm pleased to report that all construction work has now recommenced, with full COVID measures in place to ensure the health and safety of workers on site. So, as a, that's the background. So turning now to the October monitoring round itself, um, the financial position on resource continues to be very tight, with ongoing monitoring to ensure break-even against budget. The bids in October monitoring reflect the baseline pressures remaining at this stage in the year. They do not, however, include the outstanding COVID pressures, which are being bid for in a separate exercise. In terms of resource, on the road side of the business, there remains a 3.7 million estimated loss in revenues from parking and enforcement income after taking account of 2 million already allocated to this by our minister from COVID allocations. Winter gritting services um, have depended on in-year monitoring funding for a number of years now. This year, my minister set aside 3 million from the opening resource baseline allocation and a further 5 million was received from the 7 million bid made uh, for winter services in the September COVID, monitoring, or COVID bidding exercise. So this leaves a residual 2 million to fund the full estimated cost of the service this year. And this 2 million bid is included as part of the road's 3 million October monitoring bid, with the remaining 1 million for routine roads maintenance. The Minister has also bid for an additional 1.6 million to cover the expected uh, cost of leave carried forward into next year. The policy for leave carry forward across the civil service um, is that a maximum of nine days can be carried forward, and it's expected that most staff will use this maximum allowance carry forward into the next leave year, largely because they've been unable to, to take holiday. Um, on capital, Despite the COVID restrictions earlier this year, the department is, on, is now on track to spend its capital budget uh, in full at this stage, and indeed has bid for an additional 9.1 million, as highlighted in your briefing. In June monitoring, the minister made the decision to surrender 14.5 uh, million in capital funding from the A5 and A6 as a result of uh, 
the, the pandemic and the impact that that had. However, the construction sector has returned at a much more rapid pace than initially expected, and we are therefore able to we were therefore able to have 14.8 funding for the A6 restored through a previous COVID monitoring exercise in September. In early April, the estimated expenditure for the Belfast Transport Hub project was reported um, as 21.4 million or 19.8 million, and those estimates were based on projected delays of either four or six months, respectively, again, due to the impact of COVID-19. Um, on those estimates, funding of 20.4 was originally allocated by the Minister in the funding allocation in June. In reality, the project was delayed uh, by COVID-19 restrictions to a lesser extent um, than either of those scenarios. So the enabling works contractor um, ceased work on, uh, on site in March 2020, but was able to return in May, to in May 2020 with appropriate social distancing, res distancing restrictions in place. Um, and as a result, the estimated spend has increased to 22 million and Translink is requesting additional funding of 1.6 million to meet that requirement. Um, moving on to street light and column replacement, um, works have been progressing as usual and we put forward a bid to replace an additional 500 aged columns. The design life of a street light and column is 25 years, though it's common practice within the industry to assume a working life of 40 years. The department has a lighting stock of 289,000 columns and approximately 13% of these are greater than 40 years old. Um, my minister has already allocated 14 million capital to column replacement this year. And while this will maintain the current position going forward, it will not address the backlog of columns needing replaced. The allocation of 1 million, if successful, would allow the replacement of a further 500 street lighting, lighting columns, which are greater than 40 years old. The minister has also made a £1 million bid to fund the reprofiling of the contract payments for the regional planning portal system which will result in an overall cost saving of between 600 and 800,000 for both the department and the councils involved in that project. Finally, there's a capital bid in October monitoring for structural maintenance, which includes local transportation and safety measures and bridge strengthening of 5.5 million. An initial allocation of 75 million to structural maintenance in 2021 was considered a prudent approach given the restrictions in place um, due to COVID, uh, which impacted on contractor and supply chain capacity. However, as with other capital programmes, the impact of this has not been as significant as first thought. Reassessments have been made of the capacity to deliver additional actions, and a bid for 4.5 million is being presented, including costs for remedial works following Storm Francis. Failure to secure funding would result in an inevitable increase in the backlog and a further de deterioration in the state of our roads. The £1 million balance of this bid would also allow some limited but highly beneficial minor works, local transport and safety measures, including traffic signal upgrades, some localised road widening work, vehicle restraint systems, i.e. crash barriers, and bridge strengthening schemes. Um, in addition then to these October monitoring rounds or monitoring bids, um, there are outstanding COVID bids of 36.6 million as outlined in the paper. Um, and that's the, the um, outstanding balance despite some success in uh, a number of previous COVID bidding rounds. And my minister will continue to put these forward um, as additional COVID bids at every available opportunity. Um, and these bids are largely the result of significant levels of lost income in TransLink, DVA and some parts of the core department. So in closing, it's important to reiterate that the Minister is very keen to get the, the committee's views and support in shaping and delivering improvements to people's everyday lives and she welcomes your constructive challenge and input. And I hope this briefing on October monitoring will help the committee to understand the challenges that my Minister faces and the difficult financial decisions that may have to be taken in the coming months should either these October monitoring bids or the COVID bids not be met. Okay. Um, so at that point, 
I'm going to stop talking, um, but I've got Gary, Terry and John um, with me to um, answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you thank very you. much. Um, and I think we all appreciate the, the, the challenges that there are in relation to, um, to money, um, particularly within the infrastructure committee um, um, and for the department um, and the, the demands that there are um, and are continually placed on, yeah. on the department. Um, that said, just um, I have a couple of queries, just um, and a bit of explanation, mm -hmm. particularly around the bid for £1.6 million for increased holiday carry forward. I'm a little confused because on the, the further page we have uh, overtime holiday pay, pay where there's no bid required at this stage. Yeah. Um, and you have concerns that if there is a settlement that you won't have the resource yeah. to pay. So could you maybe explain that? Yes. So the carry forward issue is purely about leave that hasn't been taken this year. Um, I mean, we can, as civil servants, carry up to nine days forward into the next leave year. And I think it's a mixture of um, work pressures and, and also people not taking leave because they can't go anywhere. Um, that uh, the staff in, in DFI have not taken the amount of leave that they would normally take at this time of the year. Now, we've, we're telling everybody to please take your leave, but everybody is entitled to carry forward up to nine days leave. That's the policy. And we expect that actually a lot of staff within the department will avail of that ability to carry forward nine, nine leave days into the next leave year. And that has to be accrued for. So it's, it's technically a, a cost to the department because leave hasn't been taken. Um, the other holiday pay issue um, and overtime is a separate matter. So that is hinging on a legal case where um, uh, there was a case taken that uh, overtime, if, if you got holiday pay, overtime was not being taken into account. And for people who uh, would normally have overtime as quite a core part of, of their work, um, it was deemed that it was, it was un, uh, unfair to take out holiday pay from from uh, sorry, take holiday pay out of sorry overtime out of holiday pay, so holiday pay was just on a standard basis rather than including overtime. So this is um, a legal case that was actually taken um, in a number of different parts of the UK, and it's being appealed. So we're waiting the outcome of that because it will impact not only this department but the whole of the civil service, okay. um, and it's it's something that I think a lot of departments will be grappling with. So I, I can understand your confusion because one was holiday leave carry over and the other was holiday pay, but they're two separate matters. Okay, and so it's just, and it's, it's a broader Northern Ireland civil service issue anyway, yeah. so it'll be something obviously that will have to be dealt with, exactly. with from um, Department of Finance. Yeah. Um, In fact, the whole of the public sector okay. will, would be impacted by this. Um, no, it's, I think it's just because there was that bit obviously made yeah. in relation to that, just for clarification, it was useful. Um, you mentioned... Um, that capital you're on track to spend. Um, there was obviously some delay in relation to projects earlier in the year and money was surrendered and then reallocated. Mm -hmm. um, how did that impact then on the delivery of those projects? Yeah. Or did it impact on them at all? Yeah, John, could you maybe... Um, okay, so... Um, uh, so uh, A5 and A6 are both flagship projects, so the, the finance is ring-fenced. So surrenders go back to the centre. So in, in, in relation to A6, in particular in relation to COVID, um, there was a slowdown, uh, uh, I suppose, from March, April, uh, as contractors and everybody got to grips with what the implications of social distancing would be for construction works. But um, uh, th that picked up again uh, reasonably quickly, and, and the construction, certainly in the two A6 projects, got, got back uh, quicker than we thought. So the surrender in uh, June that was to reflect our sort of prediction that things would slow down, and the, the bid then and the COVID monitoring round reflected the reprofiling essentially back back on track again. Okay. And in, in terms of Translink and Northern Ireland Water, um, clearly Translink are now bidding for an extra 1.6 million because um, whilst the the hub, which is probably their biggest um, uh, capital program, did slow down, they're able to catch up now. So. You know, it would be a shame to, to lose momentum if we can't get that additional capital bid. And for Northern Ireland Water, um, I mean, they had originally bid um, or indicated that they would like to bid for 176 million this year, and then COVID struck, so they revised that down to 150 million. Um, however, uh, 
because, again, like the whole of the construction sector, they got back on track faster than expected. We were actually able to bid for a further 15 million, which we were successful um, in getting for them in the uh, September COVID monitoring round. So um, they're now back up to 165 million. Um, and I think that's probably as much as they can now spend in this financial year, you know, with capital. It's great if there's additional capital around, but you need a lead in time to be able to spend it. So they, um, they've said that that's about the maximum that they can spend this year. So we've, we're trying to, to claw back any lost momentum where possible and with, with the budget that's available. Yeah, I guess my next question was in relation to Northern Ireland Water and the fact that there wasn't a bid, yeah. although I do appreciate obviously the, the COVID money has been of yes. assistance to them, but um, we're more than aware of the challenges that Northern Ireland Water have yes. and, and sort of on a constituency basis too. Yes. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that you do need a lead-in time for, yeah. for any sort of substantial yeah. pieces of um, construction yeah. that need to be carried and, out. And in terms of Northern Ireland Water on resource, um, they were successful um, again in, in the last COVID round. Um, they got 27 million, um, which largely covered their resource pressures. However, we're keeping that under very close scrutiny because if there are any further restrictions um, that would impact on the use of non domestic water, it will start to increase the, the income pressures that they have. So it's a moving picture and we're keeping very close eye on that. Um, and you know, if required, we'll be bidding in, in December or January for um, further pressures if they arise. Okay, so, and you're currently working on bids for the support packages for um, coach, taxi and mm -hmm. the haulage sectors. Um, and I notice actually that you have um, indicative amounts of money which may be required for bus um, coach and taxis, but not for the hauliers. Um, yeah, I think they're they're working through all of this. Um, it's it's a really complex picture. Um, so uh, for the first minister and deputy first minister to confer the powers on our minister. They have to be satisfied that there are exceptional circumstances and that needs to be evidence-based mm -hmm. so at the moment um, uh, my colleagues are, are working through that um, i need to just check back with them where they are with the hauliers um, i know they've been doing a lot of work on on buses and taxis um, and uh, so they need to then present that evidence to make sure that, that, that there are exceptional circumstances, that there is a gap that, that um, the, the businesses involved can't access um, support from other, other parts. Um, and then the, the powers need to be conferred. So I mean, my minister is very aware that, that this is pressing and um, uh, we're moving forward as fast as we can. Um, but there is a lot of work to do just to make sure that, that um, either the governance and accountability issues um, that would come with a new scheme are fully thought through. And the amounts that are being indicated here are quite significant. Yes. Um, and are they retrospective payments as well as forecasting payments that they are requesting? Those are, I think, estimates coming from the sector itself. Um, and my colleagues in the department are working through those figures to, to verify them. So I can come back to you on that. I'm not quite sure what basis um, the sector has, has provided those figures. Okay, I'm mindful of, of, of questions to the Finance Minister on um, Monday, where obviously quite cautious in his approach to how, sort of how this was going to be spent um, and what commitment was going to be given, although obviously money has been ring-fenced, but as to, I suppose, the, the amount of money that's been ring-fenced mm -hmm. may not necessarily meet the request or the demand um, and yeah. the, perhaps the expectation? Yes, and um, you know, so there has been some money ring fenced and there's other monies in the centre um, to be allocated, but only after health has determined its requirements. So whether it comes out of the, the central pot or whether it comes out of the, what's left over, if there is anything after health has determined its needs, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that will be for the executive to determine. So. Um, and do, we have, do you have a time scale as to when you feel that you may be ready to present to um, First and Deputy First Minister? Not at this stage, but again, I, I think I, I probably need to take this away and um, you know, we'll, we'll get you a formal response from the team and the department because okay. it's actually looking into this. Okay, that would be okay. useful. Thank you. That would commit to anything that 
that a team nine can't deliver. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And just for clarity, I would declare that my that father is a quality manager for the A6 because we were talking about that. Um, just a couple of things. It mentions the, the £1 million uh, bid for uh, minor works, local transport and safety measures. Um, I've got a list the length of my arm of schemes that need to, to be taken forward in North Down, but yet we're only getting less than half a dozen road resurfacing projects in this financial year. Why are we only bidding for £1 million uh, as part of this monitoring round for these schemes where you know, I'm sure my colleagues could list other ones that they want in their constituency? Yeah. So um, I think when you get down to the smaller scale schemes, the, the, the resource that goes into designing those is, is highly disproportionate to uh, uh, the, the amount of resource. So a bigger scheme uh, leads less resource. So there's a lot of work goes into those. So there's a capacity issue within our organization in that um you know we've got a certain body of people to do the work and we have to balance up bids with the capability to, to deliver. The worst thing you could do would be to have you know give money back at the end of the year uh, because you can't deliver it. So I think these are very measured and balanced bids against the resources we have. I'm just very disappointed to see that because at the time when the industry needs that financial support as well and where people are crying out for the, these works of which a number of them didn't occur during the pandemic, you know, there should be a, a greater bid and a greater ambition to deliver things. But obviously that's the response there. I just would really hope that we're now looking towards the next financial year, that there, there's, there is a bid for funding in the next budget to get these schemes delivered because people are, really are frustrated. Yeah. The lack of progress. I, I can absolutely understand that, and you know we, we are clearly looking at um, the the capital bids for the next um, comprehensive mm. spending review, and um, we are being ambitious in what we're asking for. But I think to bid for money that that you then don't have the capacity to spend is also not not good. And I think that's probably where we are as a department now. That yeah. um, you know we can we can we can deliver so much, but we can't deliver much more than that. Just two other questions. Um, it mentions in terms of the, the departmental COVID recovery bids, and it gives you a total, and it says that the TransLink uh, is already secure. Is that £20 million pounds then already been secured? Well, there's been a commitment given by the executive that they will consider any um, further financial pressures, but we haven't been given it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's in there as a bid, um, but we haven't got it yet. So um, that twenty million is still outstanding. Right, because from my understanding, that that is what's required to, for the organisation to continue. If yeah. that twenty million pounds wasn't received, what would the impact would that be? Um, it would leave Translink in a very difficult position. I think. To, to, I mean that they have recently announced an efficiency programme, and they have managed to um, deliver um, some savings themselves, which is, is very is very good and, and very welcome. Um, but I think at this at this stage in the year, um, if they were to be asked to meet that shortfall, um, they would be left in a very, very difficult position. My understanding was that the £55 million pounds pot, which everyone wants a bit of, mm -hmm. uh, was also earmarked for transport, including TransLink. But is that, my, is that correct? Or? That's certainly where the funding would come from. Uh, yes. But as I said, until the executive actually commits it, it's not committed. Yeah. I think we would probably for myself really to follow something get clarity from the finance minister because the economy minister then stated what day is today wednesday yesterday that she didn't understand that, that transit had earmarked funds within that 55 million so mm -hmm. we need to get clarity on this because it's a, a key issue uh, the, the last one just in relation to the which is the chair talked upon uh, which is in relation to private coach operators taxis and hauliers and um, i think it would be useful to get a a breakdown of where these sums have came about because they're yeah. quite significant sums. Um, but without the powers being passed across, nothing can happen. So, uh, have, is there these powers haven't been passed across by the executive office? No, not as yet. Um, that the case needs to be made to the first minister and deputy first minister that there are exceptional circumstances and that there are gaps in. Um, the, the funding available um, to these businesses. Um, and that's the work that my colleagues are, are undertaking at the moment. It's really to gather the evidence. So <coughs> those figures are very high level and they are from the industry themselves. Um, clearly, there's work to be done to, to, to work through those figures and understand where they're coming from. 
Yeah, because my understanding was the First Minister and Deputy First Minister had made a decision to pass over these powers. Mm -hmm. So they've made a decision to pass over the powers, but now we're such in this limbo that we're yeah, they're, they, not, they're not doing it. They've indicated their intention, but there's now a formal process to go through. So they've asked our minister for the evidence um, to show that these are exceptional circumstances and that there are gaps and that this is required. And at that point, then, they will legally be able to, to, to use the Finance Act to, um, to confer the powers onto, onto my department and onto my minister. So it's a complex process, but we have to work through that. And as I said, the minister's clear that, that time is of the essence, and we're working through that as fast as we can. Yeah, I'd just like to note, and finally, is that I think, unfortunately, I think the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have unfairly and wrongly raised expectations around this. Mm -hmm. The process is going to be long and convoluted, and the amount of demand upon this funding pot is quite significant. We're hearing day after day more and more people being earmarked for access to the funding pot. Quite legitimately, very strong needs for assistance. But the, the money may not be there to give all that level of assistance to people, neither will the time skills be there. So I think it's important that that's put on the record. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome this morning, folks. Thank you. Indeed, and I would just acknowledge the work of the department on the workers on the ground. They've been doing a fantastic job through a very, very difficult period. Thank you. Uh, was it a bit rash or even a mistake to Surrender that 14.1 million of capital funding in June, considering that in May there was an indication of construction workers being back mm -hmm. on site, and they were going looking for the money again. There's also maybe the thought that if the very nature of construction and being roads and various, there is a level of like a social distance and very things. So, but mm -hmm. I mind it was always going to be one of the industries which would get up and running fairly quickly again. Mm -hmm. Was that a mistake or rather rash to surrender that money? Well, I suppose the estimates at the time were, were based on the evidence that we had um, and, uh, and in, in consultation with um, the construction sector itself. I mean, John, I don't know if you have anything else you'd want to I add. I think uh, look, it was really very uncertain times. And, uh, you did so have the indication that there was c contractors back on site in May. Well, so they... they it, 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 it's it's a case of they may have been back on site, but their productivity or output might not have been on the profile we were anticipating, and therefore you, you had to give it up. So essentially, once they get back on track again, probably in June, you know, you know, it, it started to ramp up again. Then the, the extra bid was for reprofiling, but it was there was a definite there was a degree of uncertainty, and um, they were very uncertain times. So you have to make calls on these things. And so sort of our team would have done an analysis, best guess at the time, and that ended up in a surrender in June. Uh, and, and you still that, had the rest of the year to work with as well for surrendering? Yeah, but you, you have to realise on, on those two A6 schemes, you're spending a phenomenal amount of money. So it's very, you know, it could be a million pounds a week. So, you know, when you look at it in those terms, 14, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard one to call. But certainly we, we made a call on it at the time, and that was based on the best evidence. It's since pro proven that things have picked up, and you know we've made the bid again. Good. Yep. Yep. Uh, just on the winter service and the bid for three three million at this, but it just uh, as a lay person, it sort of bugs me a bit that here we are in the mouth of winter and we're looking for three million. Mm -hmm. uh, is that not something that should be should be lobbied through finance and not to have the, they're in place at the very outset of the budget? And not depend on monitoring rounds for winter service. Well, yeah, I mean, this is my first experience in this particular role, but I know from experience in the department that every year we have tried to get this baseline, and every year it just isn't possible. Um, but I take your point absolutely. You know, it's an essential service to make sure that we're safe in the winter months. And I mean, the other thing about winter service is, I suppose, it, it, it also depends on the severity of, of the winter. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So we, we do keep a very close eye on, on long-term weather forecasts, um, just to, to see what um, amount of money will be required. Yeah, I think Linda's right. You know, so for the last, I'm sure, four or five years, uh, funding for winter service has been an issue, and it's it's very closely uh, monitored. And uh, we've had to be quite resourceful in making bids and redirecting uh, funding within the department and the resource side of the department to cover winter service. So. If I give you an example, so last year it was probably a very mild winter. I, I, I'm not exactly sure of the figure, but it's probably three and a half or four million. But if you go back two years, it's probably ten million. 
So, you know, providing for winter services is, is a difficult challenge, and it's, it's kind of an ongoing exercise of monitoring to make sure we can deliver the service. So, in terms of this year, it's looking quite good. The money seems to be with the bid. Uh, will 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 give us cover to ten million, uh, which is probably the best situation we'll have been in for a number of years. Uh, the minister had me making some uh, announcements here in relation to park and ride projects and whatnot. Are, are they still are they in any bids here? Are they in the budget for the year? Uh, yes. Um, some of them are roads and some of them are Translink, um, yeah. but they, they would all be factored into the capital programmes. Right. So I, I can maybe just give you, so the Minister allocated £4 million in June for capital for the development of park and ride projects, so they're already factored in to the departmental budget for this year. Very good, thank you. A couple of, but I'll call it there and let others in, OK? Thanks. OK, Mr Boylan. Uh, thanks, Chair. I don't think there's anything left. <laughs> but, but, oh, but, just, there, yes. but then you look in, in the road, the acting Thank you road. Very much. Um, but I want some clarification on this because it's important. Mm. Uh, Follow on from Mr. Muir. Um, it's not a case now of which minister is which and who's responsible. What you're saying, because either under the Finance Act or the Budget Act, that's the mm. powers, yeah? That, that's where the powers would lie. Right, okay. Yeah. And what we're sitting waiting now. It is a process where a bid has to be placed. Is that right or wrong? Well, what we're waiting for now is that the evidence is put by our minister to the first minister and deputy first minister right. of the but, name. But it's still part of a process. The bid That's part, part of the process. process. Then they will determine that there, yeah. whether or not and there is a, a need, and then they will confer the powers. No, hundred percent. And I see the figures there. There's big figures there, and obviously you have to put a business plan or whatever, whatever you like to call it. Yeah. But it's a bid in. in but I just want to clear that point because that's where we're sitting. Yeah. And I know for a number of months, all of us collectively have been lobbied. I yeah. mean, what we would like to see as a group, yeah. as a committee, would support for those sectors. To be honest, yes. whatever that, whatever that's yeah. going to incorporate, that's that's down to whatever the bid, yeah. the bid pro. So I just want to clear that point up. Just, and I understand the question about the the winter, but I've been on the DRD previous committee, and so I know. But and I assume, well, I'm hoping you'll get the bid. Thank you. Right? Uh, on, on the street lighting, and I just want to focus on those two things because I know myself and Mr. Muir was talking about some of the, the local programmes in his own constituency, mm -hmm. and we're the same. But say, in terms of your three million bid plus a million bid for street lighting, mm -hmm. in essence, how is that then divvied up through the council or through the the areas itself? How, if you, if you end up with the, your bids, how then is that's down to the section engineer or the manager on the ground in each area? How is that divvied up? So, in terms of street lighting, uh, it's probably uh, divided uh, in proportion to the number of columns in each area. So, it's probably a, a, a pro rata for that. Um, and the, the one million capital is in addition to fourteen million capital already allocated for street lighting column replacements. So, you know, I, I think in simple terms, it, it's a pro rata based on the number of columns. And, and in terms of the winter program itself. So. Um, well, the, the the winter program again. It's 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 there is a network of gridding routes, um, which cover something like seven thousand kilometres. So it's uh, you've probably heard this one before. It's and you know, I know the, the, I know the, the system well, John. But uh, yeah, so, so it, it is divided up again right across each each section office, and they uh, the, the money is is allocated based on on gridding actions. And you know, as you can imagine. Uh, that's, that maybe depends on the type of winter. So high routes in certain areas might get more gritting. The west or it might get more than the east. Dep depends on the weather at the end of the day. Well, well John asked in this context because I know, and for some of us who live in a reasonably yeah. high area, I mean it's it's down to the roads that carry the biggest percentage of traffic. Mm -hmm. That's what it's down to. But it's not necessarily down to the high areas, where some of those roads are not on the schedule, on the full schedule. So that's the point I'm making. No, you're you're perfectly right. So so what I mean, it's high areas on the schedule. Maybe you get gridded yeah, more no, than. But no, I accept I'm, that there are certain high areas that may not be on the schedule, and the rationale for that, and you, you know, it's probably been indicated to the committee before, is that, you know, uh, to, to to do more than that is is it, it it would require a disproportionately higher level of funding. So this is seen as the optimum uh, to provide a winter service. Well, just finally, Chair, because I know others want to, but I'm going to make a wee suggestion, so I'll put it now. Linda's now the you acting, because uh, most of us know in some of the areas is that um, 
we we get challenged every every year with the bad winter. In particular, when it's a bad winter, mm -hmm. those schools and hires that need gritting, they're not on the schedule. So it's back to the question about asking when you come late in the day, asking for the winter, and you go to the October monitoring round looking for the you know the winter program, asking for monies. I would like that focused as well. Those questions need to be asked. Some of the, they're down there for years. Mm -hmm. They're sitting within within the the local areas, within the local council structures now. People know those areas, know those roads. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it'd be any harm. And it's not about putting every road on the schedule. It's on a yearly basis, we know. So I would I would like the department to look into that and, and investigate whether or not asking for a bit of extra money for some of those areas. Right. So on for an annual basis, it, it's something for consideration. For schools? For schools, right, especially yeah. in particular around yeah. school, school areas. And so. Some of those higher areas. You know. Okay, so so that's a fair enough point, and we can take that one away. Yeah. I, I would say though, within the winter policy, there are uh, uh, the criteria used for schools and school bus routes, so that there is a policy for that. But I know the point you're trying to make. And, and we've essentially, been, we've, you know, we've been there before. Trust yeah. me. I mean, it's just for consideration. But, okay, but thank, thank you, you Miss yeah. Anderson. Hello. Hello. Hi. Am, am I okay to go on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of my questions have been answered, but can I ask? In the September monitoring round, we were notified that the loss of revenue for Translink was twenty-seven million, and the October it's twenty million. Could you explain the differential, please? Yes, I think that's because um, Translink itself has um, managed to drive down uh, the price through some efficiencies. So that that's why I don't think it's that there's less income or, or more income. It's just that they've managed to be more efficient. So that's brought down the the level of the bid. So it's been an internal uh, efficiency. Well, I'll look into that a bit more. Getting the papers late, it's hard to interrogate them, but I'll look into that a bit more. Could I? Sorry, we can't hear. That's you, Martina. Sorry. Can I pick up on one other matter? Um, just on what Cattle had mentioned, and you were talking about Gritton. Um, when the fourteen million on columns, and he had asked how that was divided up between councils. I'm thinking particularly very much about lighting. And does that fall into the same category that had been outlined on how the roads are graded? Uh, it's just to see how that money has been allocated across the 11 council areas and what's the criteria for drawing that down. So uh, I'll take that one, Linda. Um, it's probably slightly different to the uh, the criteria for winter service. It's based, it'll be based on routes and, and gridding actions on those routes. Um, the criteria for street lighting is, is basically, as I said, uh, it'll be uh, some sort of pro rata uh, against the number of columns in each of our section office areas which align the council boundaries. We get a breakdown as to what that is for each council. Obviously, I would be keen to hear what uh, Darian Shaban council is allocated in comparison to other councils, so I wouldn't mind that being broken down, Chair, if that's possible. I should be able to come back on that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Kelly? Uh, yeah. Okay. Th thanks very much, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I recall it used to be the case that um, regional development and infrastructure uh, is open too loud, it says, reduce volume, sorry. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. Can you? Right. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. Just, it, it used to be you had to rely upon um, monitoring rounds, but it's my understanding that that's a decrease in opportunity um, for infrastructure. But can I ask in particular around the regional planning? Mm -hmm. Uh, IT system. Uh, it's just to, be, to understand it because um, d does that only refer to those uh, that are based at headquarters or is this something in terms of an IT system yeah. going to be rolled out in conjunction with councillors because uh, councils? Because I understand that um, there has been a huge backlog and planning applications being processed at council level, mm -hmm. largely due to a lot of the um, 
COVID restrictions and people working from home but not having the IT infrastructure to enable them to do that through the planning portals. So this is in relation to the replacement for the planning portal, which has reached the end of its natural life. Um, so the department and 10 of the 11 councils um, are moving together to um, develop a new planning portal, um, which will, I mean, it certainly, I think, will improve the, the, the way in which the planning portal interacts. So there will be some improvements. Um, but this uh, additional bid is really, it's, it's a massive program and very technical. Um, and so they've looked at it and um, by uh, looking at, at how they work with the contractor, if they can bring some of that work forward, it's actually going to end up saving in the long run. So it's an almost an invest to save investment. Okay. Um, but you know, that new planning portal system, my understanding is um, that it, it it will be up and running, but it'll take another year or two to work through um, to, so it's fully operational. Um, but it, it will be of benefit to not only planners within the department itself, but within 10 other council areas. OK, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, uh, <coughs> Mary, I want to follow up firstly is, uh, regarding the COVID funding and, and in particular those areas where there's, they've been excluded from any funding to date from finance or, or the Department of the Economy, the coach operators, the hauliers yeah. and, and taxi drivers. Burlough's coming to an end. The contributions have been increasing. So there's a significant increased risk of redundancy the more mm -hmm. time goes on. So my question is, what time period are you targeting to try and get a bid in in this area? Because it's very urgent. Yeah. And I mean, as I said, you know, the minister is aware that it is very urgent, um, and we are working as fast as we can um, from what was a standing start to get our heads around exactly um, what's required and, and how a scheme would be geared. Um, so all I can say is as soon as possible. Um, is but it going to be a month, a week, uh, you know, Christmas? What, 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 what time frame? Any, any target there? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I don't have that information, but I, th I think you probably need um, more of a detailed briefing on, on this precise issue from the team that's actually working on it at the moment. Um, you know, all I all, all I know is that that you know, they weren't in a position now to make a bid because it's, it's not there yet. Um, but you know, we know that it's urgent, and they're doing whatever they can to, to move it forward. Then, in terms of DVA, uh, I see that there, there's a bid for 11 million for, for lost revenue, but I don't see any bid for any uh, future capital equipment or, 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 or staff. So my, my question is, there is huge pressures on DVA. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, for instance, there was approximately a thousand people queuing to get onto the website to book an MOT. Mm -hmm. The clarinet was someone who will be needing an MOT in a few months' time. Um, but also, uh, driving tests, 300 and, sorry, 730 mm -hmm. people queuing to get mm -hmm. on the website just to book the test. Yeah. And it's been extended out beyond uh, Christmas, uh, I understand it's opened up for January. Mm -hmm. So there's considerable pressure for these, these, these tests. Can you confirm the reason there's no bid? Is it all self-financing because people pay for it? Or is there a need for any additional money mm -hmm. to enable this to happen? Well, there is a bid for 11 million um, for uh, lost income, income from, from DVA. So, that, so that those would be you know, the cost of the tests, the cost of the, the driving Sorry, tests. My question is to allow so, more speedily tests to occur, to allow mm -hmm. uh, the backlog to yeah. be dealt with, does the department need any additional Capital. resources? Or is it all entirely self-financing with people paying for it themselves when they they do a test? Yeah, I mean, clearly DVA has has been through a very difficult period. Um, you know, first of all with the lift issue, and, and then with COVID, um, and um, their ability to to deliver was was um, stretched. And I know that they've they've got back as fast as they could. Um, you know, it's it's also the case that some. Um, MOT centres were being used actually for COVID testing. So I think the last of those has now been returned back to the department. So they're working as fast as they can to um, to uh, deal with the backlog. Um, and I mean, they, they are they are working within the resources they've got, um, but they, they do need that money to help to um, make good the loss of income so that they can keep um, working at the level that they're currently working. 
Um, and in terms of capital, uh, the lifts are, are now, I believe, uh, installed. So that was a big, a big capital um, expenditure that was clearly needed. Um, so it's, it's hoped that actually those lifts back in place will now start to help to clear the backlog um, and certainly an MOT testing. So, you know, I, I know what you're saying about resource um, uh, and that's that's within the bid and in capital. I think the lifts was, was probably the, the, the biggest issue. I don't know, Guy, if you've anything to add. Yeah, I mean, in terms of um, testing, the motor vehicle testing and driver testing is self-financed in the DBA. Uh, there has been, obviously, as Linda said, the drops in, the, in income, which has created the bid for 11 million, which is resource. Um, now, having resumed the testing, there's clearly the backlog that Linda meant or suggested, and there's capacity issues uh, that the minister is currently dealing with, and I know DVA are, are considering how they, that can be dealt with. They're very aware of the fact that there is a, a queue and there has been a backlog over the last number of days. Madam Chair, I think we should be following up with DVA that particular of the, of the backlog. Uh, that's something we can perhaps discuss later. But, but um, finally, then, my point regarding the briefing you've given us on the regional planning IT system, um, you've indicated that there's a uh, significant cost savings of between six hundred thousand and eight hundred thousand pounds by investing a further one million. Mm -hmm. And my question is, is that purely the scheduling of the payment to the new system that you're not investing one million to save uh, <laughs> In no. the long term, six hundred thousand is it purely a scheduling of the payment for the new system? It's the scheduling. So by bringing forward the payments in the long run, you're going to end up saving six to eight hundred um, uh, thousand on, on the overall project. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Linda, and your, the rest of your team there. Just to follow on from Mariah's point, so you're saying then for a DVA revenue from EG today or next week moving forward, are they back up to speed as in? Revenue in stream coming in? Um, they are they are working as hard as they can to get back up to full speed, and my understanding is that they're 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 there or very nearly at back at full capacity. Um, I suppose again, like everything, we're keeping a very close eye on the, um, the potential impact of further restrictions if they're required. So, you know, it's something that we're going to have to keep under under constant monitoring. Um, but at the moment, I think that they're back up to, to full capacity. Okay, and j just just on the TransLink then, and, and Sanderson touched on this. That, that's a big difference between seven, 27 million and 20 million, obviously, with savings they have pulled mm -hmm. in. Has TransLink or whoever missed the trick with furlough and their workers? Um, no, because um, they they did look at that. Um, but whilst the buses might have been fairly empty, they were still needed to run because um, essential workers still needed them. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't the case that, um, you know, there was lockdown and suddenly there were no buses on the streets. They, they just were emptier because you can't cut a public transport service because nobody's using it, or not, not nobody, but, you know, there's less people using it. Um, so did the department look at furloughing workers or Translake looking at furlough workers? Who, who made the call? that we've looked at this and we can't do it? Um, I think it was done in conjunction with the department. Um, it was certainly something that was given active consideration. Um, okay. And, you know, the, the, the uh, current savings um, and actually included um, redundancies for part of TransLink that um, runs commercial operations, the, the Ulster bus tours, which you know, they, they had to take a commercial decision on that because it's not subvented by government that, that actually that business was no longer viable. So that that's where some of the, um, the, the recent cuts have been made. OK, and then just final point, and just appreciate all the members have picked up on it. Just for clarity, considering the minister knew about the taxi haulage and, and coach industry, we've been talking about this now in here from April, May times, and mm. lots of correspondence and lots of sectors. How is the department a plan in place based on the fact but the Deputy First Minister and First Minister will come back and say, yes, if there's a, a financial impact on those organisations, those, those companies, they need support. Has the Department not a plan of this waiting on that instruction? Bear in mind, you are now doing it now, and we're into the middle of October. Yeah, and that's what we're working on. Um, but have you not got that in place? But bear in mind, we've been talking to the, the Department of Infrastructure Minister here many times mm -hmm. to say, this is your issue, yeah. this is your issue, this is your issue. And it, it now has been instructed from the First Deputy mm -hmm. First Minister, it is your issue. 
But, but that it can only be the Minister's issue once um, legislation has been put in place to give her the various to do it. So until that happens, actually, it's not her issue. Um, so, but it's been accepted that, that there needs to be something put in place. Um, we've worked collectively with um, other departments and the executive, and there's now a means to get varies identified, and that process needs to go through. So, um, you know, but, but, but this is a reflection of yeah. you. But the delay in this process is going to cost businesses and livelihoods. Yeah, and we are working as fast as we can, um, both to get the evidence together to allow the first and deputy first ministers to. to confer on my minister the powers to then act but that's the process that we're now going through and you know we have to, we can't ignore that process we have to make sure that whatever system is produced is robust and that, you know governance and accountability um, issues are, are all identified um, and that actually the scale of the, of the problem is is well understood Yes, but there's been other obviously other departments and other ministers mm -hmm. could take and flack as a, pro a process took two weeks instead of you know, some mm -hmm. departments pull the process around in one to two weeks. Yeah, but we are sitting as a department with currently no varies, and we are working through the process now to get those varies so that we can then act. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Um, and just just finally, just with regards to winter service, um, the the gridding fleet that you use um, is it in good maintenance, or is there any requirement to replace any aspect of that this this year? So I think over the last number of years, there's been an ongoing replacement of, of the gridding fleet to, to, to keep it up to, um, you know, keep it serviceable. Um, I think there's an optimum age at which we intervene. Um, I'm not sure the details. We can, I can come back to you on that one, uh, just to give you more detail. But I think I can assure you that there, there has been over a number of years a, a refreshment of the fleet. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, Miss Kelly, I think has indicated to come back in again. Well, Chair, I, I welcome the uh, clarification, please, about the back, uh, that with all the mess about in relation to additional measures to help the taxi, haulage and coach industries, it was very clearly the responsibility of the Economy Minister, and it is now uh, the decision of the First and Deputy First Minister based on evidence. Now, I understood the Economy Minister had a draft proposal that didn't get through the Executive, in which one would have assumed had an evidence base in relation to those particular industries. And I'm very disappointed that people are continuing uh, to try to play the blame game whenever they know quite well that the um, um, Infrastructure Minister didn't have the varies the power that is legally uh, to put any such scheme in place, but merely was the regulator. So I just want to put that on the record alongside Mr. Muir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, um, obviously there's quite a considerable amount that has, still has to come back to us in relation to that and, and some work still has to be done. But I think we're all very mindful of the fact that there is a, an urgency around this issue and um, we we'll look forward then yeah. to, to getting some more detail on it. Absolutely. Um, I don't think anyone else has indicated at this stage. So um, thank you all for your attendance this morning, and we'll meet you again next week in yes. relation to Brexit. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, um, probably on the back of that, obviously, we do require some more information, um, particularly around that issue, um, and I'm guessing that will come to us in due course. There is further issues around DVA, um, and uh, particularly around um, the issue of the backlog and, and how they're now addressing that, but also uh, outstanding would be an update with regards to the lifts. Um, I think we were going yeah. to... Um, and I think now you're... DVA have appointed their, have they appointed their chief executive, or certainly they're in the process of appointing a chief executive. So um, we'll maybe schedule that in, in the coming weeks. Yeah. Any other points on the back of that? It's just that it's the, the MOTs and the driving test. I mean, yes, it's very struck both. DVA I think, were last, we, last year. They they almost had an approach. We'll have to wait and see how big a demand there's going to be, and we were saying there's going to be huge demand. Well, our, the last time they came was very specifically around um, driving tests, but I think we probably just need to look at an overview, just really it's, of, it's both of, issues, of the service pressures. Um, as well. So, yeah, Chair, just through you, the the question this morning was raised about the tests. It's a major, major issue uh, now for us. 
in terms of starting. I mean, people can't get booking on now, so I take it as part of the figures as well. So we definitely need to find out fairly quickly where, where we're at with yeah. Okay, anything else? Yeah, just on that, I think I see members, and I've asked a few myself regarding tests, numbers, etc., etc. I think it's important that this, I've done, I never was that good at maths, but I can add up. That makes sense. So if you look at the figures based on the number of months we were off and no tests being done, mm. can't understand how there's only a few thousand according to the department. I don't have to get clarity on how many people is waiting to get on and how many people is queuing to get on that system. For, uh, I've got a, I suppose a conflict of interest. My own daughter's been trying to get on and she's living at the back end of March. So it's, it's pushed it way, way back. So. Okay. But there are issues in relation to driving tests and MOTs. Yeah. So it's really the overall service, I think, that we need to, to have a, a, a discussion around. Okay. Okay, I'm moving then on to item 12, which is our briefing from Assembly Research and Information Service. Um, it's a paper on decarbonising transport in Northern Ireland. You'll find that at page 197 of your papers. Um, we have Des McKibben, um, the Research Officer for the, uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly Research Office, and he will be presenting via Starleaf. Des, you're very welcome to the <coughs> committee. <coughs> Thank you very much for your paper. Can you Breaking up a wee bit. Oh, so darling. Can't hear you. Breaking up a wee bit. Did your volume up? Bad connection. Yeah. Well, it's just bad connection. Yeah. Oh, you've got the video, but it's that strange. We can, Here, yes, we can see you very clearly, but we can't hear you. Um, Speak again. I, 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 you know, you can see me. Uh, I, I, I can't hear that. anything, so is it okay if I just um, go ahead? No, we can't. We can't hear you at all. Well, so from space. Can't hear him at all. Okay. Maybe there's in is there interference with your earphones? Yeah, take them out. Take them out, yep. Yeah. Try that now, just <laughs> take out the earphones. He can't hear us. Yes, can you hear us? <laughs> can you hear us? Put your thumb up, Des, you can hear us. Can't hear really bad. Apologies. Chair, it's, 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 it's a big briefing. Hey? It's a substantial briefing this year. Will we take a brief pause just? Yeah. Yeah. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Hello. Des, can you hear us? Hello. In there for having his earphones. Hello. 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 Check them out. Can we hear him? Can you test the sign, Des? Can we? He needs to use the mic and then see. Oh. Going through, yeah. Take a take oh, a okay, I think we'll just, yeah. just pause. Now in the assembly. Paper. Um, um, and very much appreciate the work that has gone into this. Mm. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the um, So this paper was just um, requested in order to inform your discussions around carbon decarbonising transport. So basically what I've done is set out the policy framework. I've looked at uh, travel behaviour in Northern Ireland as it stands and basically um, I've provided a number of case studies around policy that, have, that involve promoting low emission vehicles and policies to promote modal shift. Um, so, uh, Interna looking at it internationally, it's an international effort to reduce climate change, and the UK and the EU are both parties to the EU, um, or sorry, to the UN Convention on Climate Change. And um, the EU and the UK are both uh, signatories to the Kyoto Protocol and uh, its success of the Paris Agreement. Now, following Brexit, the UK government has confirmed that it is still going to commit it, it is committed to um, upholding all its obligations with regards to the Paris Agreement. 
Um, the, these obligations are already enshrined in UK legislation anyway. The 2019, in 2019, the UK amended the 2008 Climate Change Act to uh, increase its target for greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from 80 percent to 100 percent by 2050. Um, and this uh, amendment applies to the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland. So just moving on, looking particularly at transport, it has become the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. Um, it had began, it had fallen from 1990 to 2013, but over the last number of years, it has actually begun to, begun to rise again. And then just to the figure two and figure three on the slides, if you can see them, they just show that of all the transport emissions, the majority of these come from um, road transport, which is a particular issue in Northern Ireland when you consider the lack of rail infrastructure. The UK government has is in the process now of developing its own transport de decarbonisation plan, but it, it, this is at the sort of the early stages. I think it's due for publication at the end of this year or maybe early next year, and this will aim to have zero emissions from all transport modes by 2050. There's a number of um, strategic priorities within this policy, but um, the ones that may be most relevant to um, the committee and to the Department for Infrastructure will be accelerating modal shift and decarbonising road vehicles and freight vehicles. The, um, the UK already has uh, brought out a road to zero strategy, which looks at tackling the emissions from road transport. It has a number of um, targets in place that, by, for example, by 2030, at least 50% of, um, say, at least 50% of new uh, cars and 40% and of new vans be, be an ultra low emission and that it will totally completely end the sale of conventional petrol cars and vans by 2040. Um, funding streams are already beginning to come through from the Road to Zero strategy. For example, there's been 48 million allocated to fund 260 new, 63 new ultra low emission buses and TransLink has already taken advantage of this scheme to set up a pilot using hydrogen powered buses, which I'll discuss a wee bit more at length later. Um, Northern Ireland doesn't have, hasn't got its own targets for climate change reductions or, um, or, 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 or targets for specific sectors, including transport. So the Committee for Climate Change, who advise the UK government, have put together some recommendations for Northern Ireland in, in the way it should um, move forward in reaching the 50 in reaching the zero target by 2050. Um, it obviously acknowledges that the UK government has a central role in setting vehicle standards, so that those standards around emissions and various tax tax schemes that may be used. It, it suggests that the Northern Ireland Executive um, must focus on basically tra transport demand management policies that will reduce demand for road transport, encourage modal shift and um, towards active and public transport. And it also um, said it also suggests that the executive can focus on policies that reduce the financial and non-financial barriers to electric car uptake. Um, so moving on to look at some of the policies in place to promote ultra-low emission vehicles, the Committee for Climate Change has, has criticised the UK the government's policy of 2050 being a target, suggesting that really if it wants to reach zero emissions by 2050, it'll have to introduce um, it'll have to reduce the sale of or sorry, eliminate the sale of um, diesel and petrol cars by 2035. And if you look at the statistics and the sort of uptake of these vehicles at the minute, you can see it's a massive challenge. 0.5% of the vehicles licensed in, in the UK are, are ULEV, and not point, it's only 0.3% of those in Northern Ireland. Um, the sort of measures that the, the executive can introduce in, in order to promote um, E-cars e in Northern Ireland will be to I suppose increase the reliability um, of and the, and the access to charging points, which is seen as a barrier, and also the cost um, thing, the cost element, which I mean it, the, the Northern Ireland executive can do in conjunction with the UK government, be just making sure that people here know that they can access these schemes. The in terms of the infrastructure, the Committee for Climate Change suggest that Northern Ireland would need about 35 rapid charging points and up to 950 top-up chargers, while the current network consists of about a third of this. Although the executive does, or the ECAR ANI and the Department for Infrastructure have noted that most of the charging will be done at home, it's important to have these, uh, this infrastructure in place to give people a sense of um, assurance that when they leave the house they will be able to top up their car when needed. 
Um, moving on, looking at freight, it's a much bigger challenge. Um, according to the Chartered Institute, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, there are no really feasible ultra low emission vehicles or electric HGVs in the market, which would suit their business models or requirements. Um, the Committee for Climate Change suggests it might be, it will be possible to decarbonise freight, but that it will require significant investment in the future and in infrastructure. Um, the Freight Transport Association agree with us, saying that their their members need to have the assurances that no matter where they go in the UK, they'll be able to refuel at any point. Decarbonising public transport is another big thing, and it's something I guess the public sector can lead on, especially here in Northern Ireland. Um, TransLink has developed its own uh, strategy to deliver zero emission bus and rail fleet by 2040, and it is currently involved in the pilot scheme, as I said earlier, to introduce a small fleet of electric fuel cell or sorry, fuel cell electric vehicles. This project re received funding from the Office of Low Emission Vehicles and cost about 4.7 million to deliver the first um, three hydrogen fuel um, buses in Northern Ireland and the first refueling station on the island of Ireland. Um, according to TransLink, the current costs of capital investment and um, for the infrastructure and, both, and the vehicles is going to be a, a massive barrier to this. And but uh, I suppose as the as the technology rolls out, there will be um, to be able to reduce these costs. TransLink has indicated that it will require approximately 41.6 million over the next 10 years to decarbonise the bus fleet and approximately 40 million pounds per annum to decarbonise the rail fleet. So there's a significant um, commitment there, which will be required from the executive. Moving on to modal shift um, policies, um, I suppose we all know that Northern Ireland is a highly car land, a highly car dependent society, and almost 90% of journeys over a mile are made by car. I suppose rurality is a big is a big factor in this. A lot of people live in um, rural areas in Northern Ireland, and that rural population is actually growing at a faster rate than the urban population. I suppose the main reason we travel is, to, is for the access work, and that accounts for all the, you know, almost a quarter of the total distance we travel every year. Unfortunately, 80% of these journeys are made in the car, and 80% of those journeys are made in cars with just one person in them. 95% of cars have no, more than two, have no more than two people inside them. Um, Looking at looking back then at um, modal shift policy since 2000, really when the first um, regional transportation strategy was brought out, um, any growth in public transport use has really just been in line with population growth, and no modal shift has occurred. <clears throat> the NA uh, Audit Office conducted a review of transport and public transport in Northern Ireland in 2016, and concluded that it brought about no modal shift, and commuters now were less likely to use public transport than they had been 10 years ago. Um, the Public Accounts Committee took a note of this report and they called for a stronger vision and leadership in order to achieve modal shift, including the use of demand management measures, which I will discuss um, in a bit more detail now. In, in addition to the sort of entrenched um, behavior, travel behaviours that we have in Northern Ireland, um, we've also got the challenges of COVID. Um, we can see from the chart here that lo lockdown had an immediate impact on demand for public transport. Um, it reduced; uh, it was it was at about 10% of the 2019 levels in March, and it only really recovered to less than 50% in um, by by the end by the middle of August of this year. Um, I'm sure it has recovered a bit more at, at with the schools going back and the students going back and stuff, but. Um, um, the figures that aren't yet available, but I think there's still undoubtedly a lot of challenges um, for attracting people to public transport now in post-COVID environment. So moving on to transport demand management measures, and I'm, I have a lot of case studies in the paper, but I didn't want to go into them in a, in a great amount of detail in this presentation, unless members want to maybe ask any questions about them. But transport um, demand management measures really are designed to either restrict or discourage car use, and these are known as push measures, or promote public transport, and these are known as pull measures. I suppose it's policies that have been in place since 2010 with the old transport with the old regional transportation strategy and the current one, is that we've tried to attract people to public transport by making them more attractive, introducing new trains, new buses, increasing service frequency, 
And while those are all very, those are all necessary policies, we can see the, the figures show that they haven't necessarily worked. One of the criticisms of the uh, audit office and the public accounts committee was that we have been on, there has been an unwillingness, I guess, to implement push measures, the sort of things that will stop people from um, driving. These these are things like um, you know increasing car parking charges, having car parking zoning that that discourage people from driving in the city centres. You know road user pricing, speed reductions, congestion management. There are a number of sort of um, policies are that can discourage car use that people that we haven't made of, that we haven't availed of yet. So just basically looking at how people choose their mode of transport, it all comes down to social norms, habit, and it's an automatic behaviour. It's an automatic behaviour of um, people in Northern Ireland to seek to drive. The number of young drivers has almost doubled over the last ten years. Um, you know, people uh, that there's people from seventeen to twenty one who are getting driving licences. So we can see. Um, just in terms of um, access to a car and, and driver license numbers, Northern Ireland is heavily car dependent, much more so than anywhere else in the UK. So, in order to move to public transport, we have to we have to provide it to encourage people to move to transport. We have to, at the very minimum, provide a quality service which is accessible, fast, seamless, safe, secure, affordable, and reliable. So, just looking at some uh, case studies um, very quickly. Um, I'm just going to look at road, road user charging as a as a sort of a restrictive measure. Um, things like uh, um, con like congestion zones have been shown to be very effective at um, reducing traffic into cities. For example, the London congestion charge brought about a 39% reduction in traffic into the zone between 2002 and 2014. Uh, it's also <clears throat> allowed for the reallocation of a lot of road space to encourage pedestrians, cyclists. And, and public transport use. It's improved road safety, and I mean, it generates a significant amount of income for transport for London, which is ring fenced and reinvested in public transport measures within within London. Car parking measures are another um, push measure, I guess. The, and the transport literature suggests that this is a significant influence on modal choice. Um, cities that have successfully reduced car dependence. Have employed restrictive parking measures, and this has achieved broad modal shift. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I mean, look, looking at Copenhagen, Copenhagen is world renowned as being a cycling city, and it has some of the best cycling infrastructure, and consequently some of the highest levels of cycling anywhere in the world. But it, it's not just cycling that has helped it achieve this. It has very restrictive um, parking measures in place, which stop people from wanting to drive into the city centre as well as a very highly functional public transport system. It should be said, but um, if you, there are parking spaces available in Copenhagen, but if um, people want to make use of them, they're going to be, have to pay a very high price for that. Since they introduced these policies, there's, they have seen a 40% reduction in private vehicle parking during the morning rush hours and a fall in the proportion of commuters coming by car from 22 to 16%, which is already, I mean, very low compared to Northern Ireland, but it does show the effectiveness of restrictive parking measures. Um, work, workplace park, car parking charges are another significant factor in modal uh, in achieving modal shift. A number of studies show that organisations who constrain the number of parking spaces or charge for the parking spaces are very successful at reducing modal shift. Um, Nottingham City Council have actually got a, a workplace parking levy charge in place where they tax effectively tax um, workplaces who provide workplace parking and this is often then um, passed on to the um, employees who have to pay for parking at their workplace or can't park. This has actually been very successful in increasing the level of public transport use for um, commuting in the city and again any money used for this is also ring, ring fence for public transport investment in the area. There are a number of public measures um, I mean, it's well rehearsed that the amount of investment that you put into things like public transport and um, and bicycle lanes and public and walking infrastructure will all increase and all be very attractive. And I have gone into some of those issues, some of those things in the, in the paper. But just moving on to something which is a bit more um, a bit more of a, a recent development, I guess, is looking at mobility as a service. The mobility as a service, which basically is an integration of all the various forms of transport available to people accessible to consumers on demand. It basically uses um, information technology to and provide a sort of a, 
a one-stop shop for all the transport options that are available from public transport, bicycles, car share, bike share, taxis, you know, Ubers, the whole entire thing. Um, I suppose the key benefit of it is that it just, it's just one app that provides one pay point and it allows people to navigate, whether it be most commonly through a city, but also across across regions. Um, the development of this mass is at a very early stage. There are um, a number of cities like Gothenburg and Madrid who have, you know, high levels of um, service providers like car share, like um, e-scooters and bicycle chairs who have r- made massive strides in um, developing their mass and um, their mass service. Um, and it has been it has shown to be very beneficial in terms of achieving modal shift. And based, and that's probably true. But, um, achieving things like improving the passenger experience. Pro, you know, we've talked in Northern Ireland over a number of years about integrating ticketing and the attractiveness, attractiveness of this to public transport users. And this is just a one step on from that, you know. Um, it, the, one of the major benefits of mass from a transport planner's perspective is that it provides a lot of data. It really gives you an idea of how people are um, how people are traveling, where they're traveling to, and when they're traveling. So it can be used really for better planning in the future as well. So it has benefits both to the consumer and to the um, government who are planning the transport. The National Transport Authority in the South have already started working on the introduction of mass. Um, they view their role as a, a, as a transport authority uh, um, and regulator as basically providing the, the, reg, the correct regulatory operating environment for mass to take off. So, you know, introducing the right legislation and creating the, the right environment so that both private, private companies and public transport companies can all share information and share services in one, in one app. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the NTA hope that they will have a, basically a single, a single app that will um, give a range, give access to a range of services across the entire island of, or across the entire um, country of Ireland. Um, the House of Commons Transport Committee have said have said something very similar to the South. They realise that the UK government's um, main role is to um, ensure that the government sets out its vision for mass and how it can take a, how it can be a, a, you know an important part of the overall transport um, provision in the country. Its role, it says, is to provide um, financial support and you know to create a sustainable legislative and regulatory regulatory environment in which it can operate. Um, so again, that, that's just one example of, so, I suppose, where um, the types of services, the way the way public transport and even personal mobility is uh, changing. And um, I'm happy to take any questions now. Okay, thank you. Um, that's quite a, a, a weighty piece of research that you carried out for us, and, and again, um, very much appreciated. Members, any comments um, at this stage? Because. Yeah, because that is a good piece of work, and I just I don't want to do it on injustice. Just just a couple of points, because um, see, in terms of obviously, there's a heavy reliance of single-use vehicles in the countryside and rural areas, yeah. and I just wanted to know how um, you know we're talking about decarbonisation. So I mean, you know, how are we going to encourage those people? Um, you know. Or is there any other ways we can we can influence that? I mean, like, like working from home or something else. If we're serious about about you know the overall plan, because you know yourself, if you head in the motorways down into Belfast, you know most of the cars are travelling 30, 40, 50 miles. So, and, and those are yeah. generally single-use vehicles. So, I just wanted to ask you that in relation to, especially from a rural per- yeah. perspective, you know. Yeah, I think the I think the park and share facilities that have been installed by the department over the last number of years seem to have been very successful. I know I, I come from Newry myself and I know that uh, I have and I've availed of that service and the car parks in and around the um, town to be very overcrowded in the mornings and have actually been extended on a number of occasions by the department to try and accommodate those people who maybe want to drive from a more rural area into a you know, into a town or somewhere where it's easier to mix up or to meet up with their um, counterparts and drive to drive to work. Certainly, I think um, the rise in um, you know working from home has been meteoric since the 
since the lockdown has started and it really remains to be seen how for how long that will continue for. Obviously, there are a number of issues around encouraging that from the point of view of the impact it's had in city centres, but I read some research that was produced by the um, Belfast um, Chamber and they, and they suggested that there's only really around 5-10% of work office workers have returned at this stage, so certainly I think that could have long-term impacts which need to be monitored down the line. Just say in terms of the, the electric vehicles, obviously I know you said was it 0.3 for here or maybe even less. Um, three percent, yeah. Five, yeah, I mean, you know that means there's one over a million vehicles on the road. I mean, you know that's a big challenge mm-hmm. for us in terms of infrastructure. We're serious about about getting you know to people to use those vehicles. You know, so and yeah. would you like to expand on that or any ideas and some of the some of the research you've done? I mean, the committee for climate change seemed to be you know of the opinion in their work that they have done that, you know, one of the biggest barriers to um, electric vehicle up- uptake is the, um, I suppose, the fear of running out of fuel. But Northern Ireland, I guess, being such a small a small area, you know, with vehicles now coming back with um, ranges of up to tr- nearly getting edging towards 300 miles, I think once that, once that starts to get out there and people realise, you know, that the likelihood of them um, not being able to complete their journey reduces, then they will they will begin to avail of them. But I think probably the other significant challenge is the cost of the vehicles. But again, you know, we're going to have to see significant um, investment, I guess, by the UK government in terms of providing access to these vehicles. But as as manufacturers start to move away from, um, you know, producing diesel and petrol cars and producing more electric cars, the costs are surely have to go down. I think there's some research that shows by 2018 there will be, or sorry, by 2028 there'll be more of a parity in the cost of these vehicles, and by then we'll start to see, you know, much higher uptake. And just, just one wee final point. Just in terms, of obviously you mentioned about uh, active travel and cycling and all that. In terms of we're serious about trying to get people onto cycles and trying to use that that active tra- travel element. Would you like to respond to that just? Yeah, I think um, I think the, the city of Copenhagen is a very good example of how you get people, more people, to cycle. Um, I mean, obviously, just by building cycle lanes on its own isn't going to make people cycle into the city. It might, it'll obviously, it, it'll create a certain amount of demand, but you also need a suite of measures. You know, an integrated approach to basically of using those um, um, pull measures or, sorry, excuse me, push measures, which put people off driving into the city centre, make them think twice about taking a um, taking a car for a two or three mile commute into the city centre of Belfast whenever they can um, because of the cost of parking or other you know other measures and um, just just in basically uh, le- restricting the, the level of parking in Belfast city centre. I think um, some of the travel to work statistics show that even people who live within five miles to, wor- to work, 70% of them use the car, use a car. So I think there's certainly traction to be made from targeting those people and making it making it more cycling more attractive or you know almost a better option than driving. No, thanks very much for your paper. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks, Des, for such a comprehensive paper and a presentation. There's a lot of work went into that, and it's really really useful. Just one issue: there's a thank lot you. of focus about moving towards um, electric cars and e-cars and the charging infrastructure around that. Alongside that discussion, there's also a discussion around hydrogen. So there's just two technologies. Mm-hmm. Some of the discussions that have been coming forward around um, electric cars and electric vehicles has been around the environmental consequences of the disposal of those batteries, um, because you have to actually replace those after a period of time. I just don't know whether that's something that you've got any sort of research uh, or, or facts on, or, or there's an emerging discussion because some of the People are now saying actually that uh, electric is, you know, in terms of a battery-based situation, is actually going out of fashion, and now it's moving towards hydrogen. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't actually done any um, research looking at the disposal of batteries or the issues around that, but that's something that I can um, definitely come back to you on. Um, most of the research I have looked at has talked about hydrogen as being probably the most viable technology for. Um, freight and for um, public transport use, you know, for larger vehicles, basically. But that um, smaller battery-powered cars are probably the, seem to be, there seem to be a lot of 
not consensus, but a lot of um, a lot of people in favour that um, you know smaller battery powered cars are the 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 way forward for for personal mobility. But um, I can I, that is something that, that I can look at um, in more detail and see you know provide some more detail on the on the position around the the sort of the problems with these technologies moving forward if the member is content with that. Yeah, that, that would be appreciated and I agree with your point around the hydrogen thing. Just a lot of media reports that came forward in terms of the disposal of those batteries, particularly into the more developing world, where that's where the, yeah. and the people are exporting that problem, which I don't think is fair enough. Okay. Yeah, okay, no problem. I'll look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if members are content, because this was quite a comprehensive piece of work, that we, we look at this again, yeah. uh, return to it next week, Absolutely. maybe with suggestions as to how we move forward, because we may want us to drill down into some aspects of this and maybe do um, a micro inquiry or. Um, as you're back next week, yeah. And he, well, I think as a. I think it's a next step. I think maybe the committee may need to have a discussion as to what our next steps right, are okay, in, okay. in approaching yeah. this and then speak to Des again um, right. as to okay. where we want him to enough. take the research. So thank you very much again. Thanks, Des. Thanks. 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 Okay. okay, no problem. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Are members content with that yeah, that, plan? Was, okay. that was a good piece. That was a good piece, that was good piece of work. Mm. So thank you. Then moving into our next item, which is item 13, that's our forward work programme. Just draw your attention to that and the scheduled briefings and just until the Halloween um, recess. Are members content? Mm -hmm. um, any other business at this stage? Sure, one thing. Um, it, it, obviously, there's a debate yesterday and there's something we need to look at from a planning point of view. The, the NACA the okay. Bay. Okay. And I mean, just as we're going through the, the planning review, it's something we need to look at because, I mean, obviously, clearly there was going by some of the reports or some of the conversation yesterday and not debate the uh, there wasn't proper I don't know, proper process or things arising. Okay. So something we just need to keep on, on the just keep a watching brief yeah, on it'll that. Help, it'll help form part of our discussions in the terms of reference. Okay. Okay, anything further? Oh, okay, thank you. you. Just advise members as you leave to maintain social distancing and to take all your belongings with you. Um, the date and location of the next meeting will be in this room on Wednesday the 14th of October at 10 a.m. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.